This is Anita Gale. I'm CEO of the National Space Society. It's a pleasure to have you join us for the 2021 International Space Development Conference. All virtual this year, at least we have content for you and programming for you. We hope you enjoy it and uh, we'll see you next year in Arlington, Virginia. Thank you. Dear Earth, we're sorry for all the things we've done to you. We're sorry for coal plants, oil spills, nuclear waste, dirty factories, auto emissions, wildfires, and climate change. We really didn't understand. We didn't mean to hurt you, but our needs got the best of us. Now we know there's a better way, one that will give us everything we need without harming you ever again. Can we start over? We have a new plan, and we really mean it this time. We promise. It's all about electricity. We know, we've tried that before. Coal, oil, gas. Those were the choices for a different time. But we promise to do better because we have a new source of power at our fingertips. Space solar power. The sun provides clean and virtually limitless power 24 hours a day. It is a huge, inexhaustible source of energy that will be kind to you, Mother Earth. The ways we currently harness solar power are a great start, but only provide energy for part of the day and are limited by weather and other conditions here on Earth. And your atmosphere, while we cherish it, reflects about a third of the sun's energy back into space. Solar power generated in space and sent back to Earth frees us from these limitations and will allow us to provide virtually unlimited amounts of energy to the entire planet night and day. Space solar power is clean, abundant, and the costs of collecting and transmitting it back to you, dear Earth, are negligible. And space solar power is virtually emissions-free and kind to you. We have the rockets and the proven technology we need to start building space solar power now. We may even be able to utilize the resources of your neighbor, the moon, to build these orbiting power stations. We really want to do the right thing, Mother Earth. We're ready if you are. Space solar power will help us to repair the climate and make you healthier than ever. So what do you say, Earth? Ready to give us a second chance? Space solar power is the answer. To learn more and donate, go to go.nss.org ssp. I'm speaking today with Jim Green, who is the chief scientist for NASA, which is about the coolest title I think you can have. He started with NASA in 1980, worked in a number of positions over the, over the many years, including being the director of the Planetary Science Division. And uh, Jim, you were also a safety diver at the neutral buoyancy tank, which is something we don't normally associate with being the chief scientist at NASA. Can you tell us a little bit about that real quick? Well, that's one of those jobs that I just sort of fell into, you know, as a diver uh, when I was at the University of Iowa, uh, when I went to Marshall Space Flight Center, I had the opportunity to apply and become uh, a safety diver in the, in the tank. And my responsibility was waiting out the suited subject, whether it was an astronaut or engineer, making sure they were safe and neutrally buoyant and taking them down to whatever they were doing, repairing the telescope, you know, uh, putting new instruments into Hubble, uh, building structures, and I just had a wonderful time and made about 150 dives uh, over the five years I was at Marshall Space Flight Center. And that's in addition to all the other work you were doing, of course. In, yeah, actually, I was very, you know, see, as a postdoc, I was actually scientifically, you know, pretty productive. <laughs> that's really cool. And the neutral buoyancy tank, I've, I've only been there once, but what an incredible facility. I mean, I'm not a diver. But I remember walking up to this immense multi-million gallon tank, as I recall, 
and just think you just want to jump in. Yeah, yeah, I, you got it right, and that's what I did. <laughs> so we're here today, though, to talk about um, a recent article that you wrote with a co-author about volatiles on the moon. And I think when a lot of people hear that title, they think, uh, depending on how how science literate they are, they might think either the moon's got a bad temper or what the heck is that, you know, or if they know what volatiles are, you know, yeah, yeah, we've heard there's water on the moon. We know that. So what's new? This article was so new and so fresh and so interesting that, and I read a lot of stuff, I literally got chills when I got around to reading <laughs> what you're talking about because I had no idea and yeah. I probably could have, but I didn't. So uh, you've re we've re-examined some Apollo samples from mm -hmm. about 50 years ago and you've come to another number of fantastic conclusions. So would you walk us through that, please? You bet. And as you said, you you know, you got chills. And that's the perfect thing, because in these permanently shadowed regions, they are so cold. They're colder than the surface of Pluto. And so what volatiles are, are those things that we see here on Earth that go through phases like water does. So you have vapor, uh, you have a solid. Uh, and of course, uh, you have then... Um, uh, snow, uh, you know, you have uh, uh, those three phases. And so what happens then is uh, uh, the temperature changes that could occur on the moon, uh, you know, would liberate this water that then allows it to travel. And then it's a cold trap because they are so cold, these permanently shadowed regions, and they accumulate. And so over the last 10 or 15 years or so, we've been studying this area and we've determined that there's a significant amount of water in these permanently shadowed regions. Several hundred million tons, we believe. But that's just the start of it. The more we looked at the early history of the moon, the more we realized there could be many other volatiles, you know, such as carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, uh, hydrogen sulfide, all kinds of things. Now, and so how did we come up with that idea? It really starts with uh, what we know about the origin of the moon. And indeed, the concept of two objects colliding, the proto-Earth and a large uh, Mars-sized object, and then re-accreting, creating the Earth and the moon. What we're finding out soon after that uh, creation of the moon, things settled down and the moon started having a magnetic field. And we see that in the rock record from Apollo that we brought back. And so we've done modeling between the Earth and the moon's magnetic field, and we see they intertwine. And that means early atmosphere of the Earth could actually make it to the moon and go to these cold traps. And so that started the whole line of reasoning that's really exciting about what actually might be in these areas. So uh, in those early days, the moon was a lot closer to Earth than it is now, right? Right. After that formed, uh, the moon formed, it formed at about three or four Earth radii away, really close. It has to form in a region called the Roche limit outside of that. Think of Saturn. All of Saturn's rings are inside the Roche limit. So there's no solid body that really comes together in any way. But outside the Roche limit, you then can accrete and begin the process of building a larger body. And that's where the moon concept comes from. It's left over from this impact with Thea and the debris outside the Roche limit ends up being the moon. So the permanently shadowed regions you're talking about primarily at the poles. And I think what you're talking about specifically here is the South Pole, is that right? Well, it'd be the South Pole and the North Pole. Uh, you know, the moon's rotational axis is only a few degrees from the orbit plane uh, with the uh, with the uh, sun. And so that means it doesn't have the big seasons we do. OK. And so as the moon goes around the Earth and that would be one day on the moon, there are regions in these deep craters that never, ever will see the sunlight. And the law of thermodynamics says volatiles will move into these cold traps, we call them. So uh, besides the fact that, that we're very interested in finding resources on the moon, such as water, yeah. um, rocket fuel and breathable oxygen and so forth, 
this also does this also give you a unique look at the uh, the evolution of the early Earth and Moon? Yeah, it does. In fact, another thing that we found from the rock record is that there are some really newer rocks on the moon that were created during a time we call the late heavy bombardment. And for a long time, we didn't understand what that was. So the earth and moon were created at about 4.5 billion years ago. And about 500 million years after that, there was an enormous bombardment that was going on in the inner part of the solar system. And it comes from the giant planets rearranging themselves messing up the asteroid belt, throwing these asteroids towards all these, all these rocky planets like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and of course the moon. And that record turns out to be on the moon. That record's been eradicated here on Earth because of our biosphere, our plate tectonics, but that record's on the moon. So when we brought back these rocks and they were only 4 billion years old, not four and a half billion years old, we recognized that something had happened during that time period. Well, these objects coming out of the asteroid belt that hit the moon, they were huge. They blew big holes in the crust. And so that lower crust upper mantle of magma started filling them in and created these lava fields. And when you look at the moon and you see those dark spots, that's what we're talking about. Those are lava fields. Now, recently, you know, the calculations have come out saying, well, if the magma, meaning melted rock, is filling up these holes at the late heavy bombardment, the moon's also got to be outgassing. And so now the moon is building up an atmosphere. Now, normally without a magnetic field, you'd strip that away. It'd be gone pretty quick. But the moon also from the rock record tells us it had a magnetic field. And so it actually could hold on to it. In fact, the current estimates are that the, the pressure of the lunar atmosphere is greater than the pressure in the atmosphere of Mars today. So it's about 10 or 12 millibar at that time, at the height of uh, the lunar atmosphere. Well, the lunar atmosphere allows gases then to circulate. And just like cold gases here on Earth, uh, the cold traps attract, uh, you know, volatiles and it snows in our poles. And indeed, on the moon, those volatiles will go and then collapse. So what are they? Well, they're carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. Things that come out of volcanoes here on Earth must have also come out of volcanoes on the moon because the Earth and Moon have the same basic composition. So this is really exciting. That means the, the stratigraphy of, of uh, the record of the uh, origin uh, and then evolution of the Moon and Earth is trapped in these permanently uh, shadowed regions. And so we, wanna, we, wanna, we want an ice core. You know, we want to go there, core these permanently shadowed regions, and then verify this uh, scenario of how this material got there. So you kind of touched on this, but I just wonder if you could go a little deeper. I understand how that tells us about uh, the the history of the formation of the moon and and of that proto atmosphere you were talking about and so forth. Other than what the Earth's atmosphere was like at that time, does it tell us anything else about the evolution of the Earth? Well, we really don't know much about the early Earth atmosphere. OK, mm. I mean, the rock record on Earth is only about 3.8 billion years ago because all the oldest rocks have been recirculated because of the turning over through plate tectonics of our crust. And so we can only guess what it might be. The way we know about early Earth atmosphere is to find uh, old rocks, uh, you know, a volcanic in particular and find the uh, trapped atmosphere inside them, okay? And so then we can get a good idea as to how it evolved. It's clear though, that there probably wasn't much oxygen. It probably was dominated by CO2, uh, which is carbon dioxide, and then a significant amount of nitrogen also. And those things, those volatiles, you know, can indeed be ionized in our upper atmosphere, in the ionosphere, we called it. And then they start moving down those field lines. 
And if they end up on the field lines that connect to the moon, they're eventually going to find their way to those uh, permanently shadowed regions in those coal traps and then collapse there. And so that record's there if we can get to it. If we can just tease it out, if we can get there and get these cores and be able to understand that record. Now, there are a couple problems. And one of the problems is, well, it could be mixed up a little bit because of micrometeors hitting, hitting the moon, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but in the early, early moon, when it did have an atmosphere, some of those won't make it to the surface. That also tells us potentially how the regolith may increase over time as the moon loses its atmosphere, allowing more of these, these small uh, micrometeors to be able to make it to the surface. So we're really anticipating some great discoveries once we can, once scientifically we can get in these permanently shattered regions. So if I understand you correctly, not only did the moon get some of its volatiles from the same sources as the early Earth, but there's actually some sharing of atmospheres going on because of their proximity and the magnetic field. Yeah, indeed. In fact, uh, and it's more than just atmosphere. Uh, it, it, you may remember just about a year or two ago, the discovery of a wonderfully old rock in the Apollo record that turns out to be an Earth rock. It's not a lunar rock, and it's a rock that's more than 4 billion years old. So in reality, we had to go to the moon to get a rock the oldest rock of Earth. And that's because impacts, in particular during these late heavy bombardments, are, are hammering the Earth, spewing material up, for which then as the moon moves in its orbit, it will gather them up and fall on the surface. And, and we were just lucky enough to bring back the right rock. And it's like it's been sitting in a museum for all this time, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Indeed. So the other thing that we found out, of course, from the Apollo uh, missions is we put a retro reflector down on the surface and we hit it with a laser every year. Okay, now why do we do that? Didn't we get it right the first year? Well, <laughs> we're finding out that each year the moon is moving away from the Earth. Okay, so the tidal forces are being dissipated and therefore that energy uh, is uh, being dissipated in a way that makes the angular momentum of the moon going around the earth change and therefore the result is it moves away from the earth. And it's been doing that ever since it was created. So it went from three earth radii to where it is now and that's 60 earth radii away from the moon. So all these clues that we've been getting, you know, the Apollo rocks, you know, the retro reflecting, uh, the magnetic field, you know, all the exchange of gases that we, we believe were occurring, the, the late heavy bombardment, that's adding up to a fantastic history. What we want to do then is verify all these ideas by indeed getting these cores. So if I was the chief scientist at NASA, and it's a very good thing that, that I'm not, but if I was in your position and I want my drill mission to go get my core sample, do I just pull out a checkbook and sign a piece of paper and set it off and get my mission? Well, uh, not exactly. You know, we uh, we work in a way for which the best ideas, we want to bubble up to the top. Uh, we want to be able to also uh, understand how a mission would um, uh, make the measurements necessary to answer the questions. And then it has to also be affordable. You know, uh, we really have to be able to put all those uh, elements together to get a mission. Now, the first one that's very uh, similar to what we would like to do, of course, uh, is Viper. Viper will go into a permanently shadowed area. It's a rover. We're building it now. It will drill down. Now, not as far or as deep as we'd like to, but it will begin the process of uncovering is it just water or are there more volatiles there? And if it sees more volatiles, that then will spur us on to the next big questions that can only be answered if we get deeper cores. And I mean, you know, many meters, tens of meters in, in terms of their length. And is that something that you could do robotically or do you really need human hands there? Well, you know, uh, Indeed, you can uh, create a mission to do it robotically, but then you cost it out, 
all right? Or you can say, all right, let's say some of the first experiments we want the astronauts to do are indeed coring. And so what is that like? And so to tease that out a little bit, we put together a team of people that included a lot of the Earth scientists that are funded by the National Science Foundation to go to Greenland and to go to the Antarctic and to create ice cores so that we understand how to make them, you know, how to trek out into the field, figure out here's where we want to go, and, and, then, and then set up equipment and make these ice cores. So they bring portable systems with them, and they can drill to seven, eight hundred meters. I mean, it's phenomenal what these, what these scientists can do. And so once you get the cores, how do you take care of them? You know, how you do all that? And so uh, we, with this group, we've really teased out that whole process. So we're not done with the analysis, but it looks like I would say uh, the humans could do it best, the easiest, and we'll learn an enormous amount. So scientifically, I can't wait for Artemis to put uh, humans on the south pole of the moon. And and uh, just to closing, because we're, we're running out of time here, um, this, of course, has vast implications for the long-term hab habitation of the moon and being able to do ongoing work on the moon and for moving on to Mars. Absolutely. So when we looked and we see, okay, we can, uh, from uh, uh, orbit, yes, there's water there. We, we have the way to see it. It's um, uh, H2O or it's hydrox hydroxyl OH. The concept is then we can still split it apart, and make rocket fuel. There might be a significantly more set of oxygen that's trapped in carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide that's also part of being trapped in these permanently shadowed regions. So in reality, we have sort of a taste of what might be there. And until we get in there and really do the analysis, that's when we'll know what that total resource is like. And it could be vast. Well, this has really been a sensational conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. And it's just wonderful to, to get this new information from the source and the man who wrote the article. <laughs> so I really appreciate you, appreciate you coming on today, and I hope we can do this again. My pleasure, Rod. Thanks so much for inviting me. Hello, my name is Tony DiTora. I am Vice President of Policy Coherence of the Beyond Earth Institute. Our mission at Beyond Earth is to create and sustain a legal and policy framework to enable economically vibrant communities of people living and working beyond planet Earth. We generally, generally refer to these economically vibrant self-governing groups as communities beyond Earth. I'd like to introduce Steve Wolf, the President of Beyond Earth, and Sean Hadley, the Chief Operating Officer. All three of us are also co-founders of the Beyond Earth Institute. Steve, Sean, welcome. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Tony. So our topic for this session is policy recommendations to accelerate the establishment of communities beyond Earth. So the research from our initial paper last year identified three initial policy recommendations, which I'll sum up as the US government must revamp the arms and export control regime, including ITAR and CFIUS, the international aerospace industry should establish voluntary norms of behavior surrounding commercial activities in space. And continuing in the direction initiated by the NASA Artemis Accords, create international agreements with like-minded allies focused on commercial space development. Now, in the year since that paper, our team has identified other very interesting policy areas that will be critical to accelerating communities beyond Earth. These include the moon approaches, Artemis, Moon Village, and the Russian Chinese lunar base. Also includes property rights and exclusion zones, financial policy, space infrastructure, approaches to regulating in space activity, and plenty of other areas. So Steve, let's turn it over to you. Which of these new policy areas are you most excited about and why? Right, thanks, Tony. And I, I, I wanna, uh, if, if, I, if, if I can, I'd like to step back a little bit and, and talk a little bit about the um, the paper that we did last year, which gave us those those initial uh, uh, recommendations, uh, because uh, it was interesting going into that into that uh, research effort, where we we might have thought that the the reaction we were getting from the individuals that we spoke to uh, that uh, 
we would see a broader, maybe technology oriented recommendations that we needed to get to the moon or we needed to get to Mars. And uh, we found out that the, the immediate stumbling blocks uh, for us getting to creating a communities beyond earth were, were uh, uh, more basic uh, in a lot of ways. You know, how are we gonna work together? You know, what are the, and that sort of led to, uh, or similar to Artemis Accords, you know, what are the impediments in terms of working internationally? So that's ITAR and, <clears throat> and those issues. So I think, I, I don't wanna, in, in, in this conversation, I, I think it's important that we not uh, overlook that piece of it, right? And recognize how important that, the, that dimension is. Um, I think beyond that, I think all of the things that you mentioned are important. Artemis is critical uh, for us. It is setting a tone for uh, expansion of human activity uh, beyond low Earth orbit. And that really can't be understated. Um, obviously, we want that to happen with a uh, very robust commercial component. And NASA so far seems to be going in that direction. Uh, so that's what I'm really looking uh, looking at right now. All right, great. So, Sean, is Steve right about what the most exciting policy area is? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's the president, so the president is always right. <laughs> I uh, guess so. But absolutely, and I, 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 I agree, too, that Obviously, Artemis being when we did the paper initially it was you know it was it was an issue, but now we, we know a little bit more. We've done a little bit more research on it, and I agree that certainly that particular mission, right? Because let's look at it like a mission can can lend itself into accelerating some of our policy recommendations that we've already put together. Um, the one kind of nuance to add is looking at the entirety of the paper that we did, and and I think what Steve said is spot on. It is not a technology problem, although we shouldn't underestimate some of those issues, right, obviously, but it is a policy and a resource problem. And so what we came out of the paper is that we said, wow, there are actually systems here. There are systems issues that have to be tweaked, massaged in some form or another in order to allow for the further development. Do we all say, well, we'll get there eventually? Yes, but all of us here on, you know, at Beyond Earth Institute said, we were surprised we're not there yet, given where we thought we would be, right? And that was kind of the question we wanted to look at with this research. And so I think um, revealing some of those systems problems at a deeper level and the policy recommendations to say, look, we got to look at the, the full picture and understand how can we change some of these levers uh, so that we're not creating more problems, more impediments, as Steve mentioned, into moving everything forward. So I think that piece is really exciting. And, you know, uh, what came out of that research, especially with, I think, looking at um, some of the nuances with the voluntary norms, conflict resolution mechanisms becoming kind of a bigger theme, right, uh, uh, where we are now. All of those things together, will, I think, will, will lend itself to even more um, meaningful policy recommendations uh, as we're moving forward with the research at the Beyond Institute. Okay, very good. So let's touch on that a little bit more, though, since Russia and China have not signed the Artemis Accords and have not really been invited to participate in Artemis, though I guess uh, NASA has an open invitation to many nations. <laughs> um, you know, what are your thoughts about uh, how the United States and it, the what I'll call the Artemis, you know, uh, countries, uh, how should they respond to that? Should they try to embrace China and Russia? Should they should it be a, you know, a competition, either friendly or not friendly? What are your thoughts on that? Steve, why don't you take that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I also, uh, Tony, also want to hear your thoughts on some of these. <laughs> well, <laughs> you don't get off the hook on that. <laughs> no, no, I'll weigh in in a minute. <laughs> no, uh, you know, right now it's very, uh, you know, clearly uh, China has uh, positioned itself as a competitor in space, particularly with human uh, activity. Uh, they've, they've announced their intentions to establish a moon base, uh, <coughs> uh, also partner, partner with Russia. Um, and that's kind of unfortunate. Uh, some folks may say, well, the competition uh, may be good for space overall. Uh, I think ultimately, uh, I, I, at least I would like to think that ultimately um, 
uh, activities will go on, all nations will be involved, and ultimately that will be uh, a largely peaceful endeavor. Um, obviously, uh, relations are, are, are strained right now, so we have to be cautious about that. Um, I, I do think that uh, it's important for NASA to keep that, um, uh, to keep uh, the invitation open to China and Russia and all nations to be part of, of the accords or something similar. You know, I think I, you know, hats off to NASA and the administration, the prior administration for initiating the, uh, the, the accords. Um, but, uh, you know, if that, if those accords survive on a, on a multilateral basis and can include all spacefaring nations, uh, it could be expanded upon because I think that uh, even from our perspective, we see that the accords are kind of just a starting point. You know, when we start to look at um, uh, the idea that humans will eventually uh, create communities beyond Earth, um, the accords don't quite cover all of the considerations uh, that, that would go into such a thing. So. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that it will be a peaceful and prosperous future for all nations as we move into space. Gotcha. If I may, Tony, just yeah. add one thing that came out of our research last year. There was definitely an abundance of caution regarding the development of two separate and competing space systems for enabling the uh, acceleration of communities beyond Earth. Because if we have other nations building their entire separate infrastructure and system and norms, right, governing that system. And then we have another system over here, again, different norms, different structures, different systems, and you have two competing systems. It may actually slow down the acceleration, which we are at Beyond Earth trying to move forward. Um, building a whole new separate system could be, could be an issue. Um, so as Steve mentioned, you know, let's, let's hope that that doesn't come to pass in the long term, but it's certainly a caution that a lot of the uh, experts that, that we've been talking to and the research we've been doing have, have pointed to as, as a potential problem in the long term. So concerns and, and about this, balkanization. And on this point, right. yeah, on this point, on this point, Tony, I definitely want to hear your, your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's 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 absolutely an important question. And mm -hmm. I mean, your CD will not play in the 8-track tape player, right? right. So, <laughs> but you're not even going to develop an eight, uh, a CD player or a Blu-ray or whatever else right. if you're stuck on the 8-track tape player versus cassette tape debate, right? And it's my technology is better than yours. You look at what happened with the International Space Station, where the United States and, the, uh, and Russia have completely separate systems on, on there. And it's still designed to this day so that they can just shut the door and separate if they need to. Um, now, hopefully we don't need to do that. But the path that they have taken does not enable commercial space stations because it just costs so much money to run the international space stations. And we've been able to do a lot of commercial activity up there. But oftentimes that's been over the objections of NASA, for example. I was just mm -hmm. telling my wife the other day when they wanted to do the first pitch, throwing that out in the ceremonial fashion on the International Space Station, they could not send up the baseball in the United States. They had to send it to Russia to launch it up to the space station because the Russians were like, yes, give me your money. So <laughs> they were trying to enable the commercial approach. And there's a whole host of reasons for that. But the policy needs to enable more people to get involved, more people to engage. And when you look at a moon base, if you have separate moon bases that are not interacting with one another, that are basically prohibited from interacting with one another, that is not going to further what I think we're interested in. Right. And I think just, uh, I mean, I would like to think that just for, just for safety and security reasons, uh, uh, of the astronauts themselves that we would want to have some sort of reciprocal understanding uh, to um, uh, for, for search and rescue missions for, for them and for us. I mean, uh, I'm sure even I'm sure amongst the, 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 the Chinese astronauts and the, uh, the American astronauts and cosmonauts and so forth, uh, there's a lot of uh, camaraderie, you know, that they feel with each other, uh, despite what the what the nations uh, and what the what the leaders of the countries might might be involved in. So, uh, you know, that that's that that's an important. Um, so, uh, I'd like to play off that a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that I would agree wholeheartedly on that. 
I mean, people who are explorers try to help other explorers. We, we've seen that throughout human history, uh, unless they're already in a, a, a shooting war or, or a sword fight, I guess. But um, I also know that there's a certain level of um, resistance to non-government astronauts. So if you look at um, government astronauts compared to commercial astronauts, there is sometimes a reluctance to embrace those commercial astronauts in the mm -hmm. same way that they would embrace other government astronauts. And the mm -hmm. other thing is the governments back on Earth, how are they going to sort of um, dictate to their people when to help and when not to help? And what kind of repercussions might they face back on Earth right. if they go against those sorts of things? So yeah. those are all just different policies that we, we, we should consider. Yeah. And I think that you know you you have uh, you know everyone has their sights on the uh, on the lunar polar region where uh, there are stores of ice. So you know it's not like everyone can spread out. I mean, folks are going to be keying on uh, similar similar locations, uh, and obviously proximity is always creates always creates a potential for conflict, and we have to be prepared for that. You know, and I think we have to be responsible. I think we have to. Uh, you know, we we as countries, and I'll just get a little, I'll just get a little uh, uh, woo woo here if I could. But you know, we have to kind of grow up as countries, and we can't just use every, we can't risk armed conflict over every, you know, uh, 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 infraction or or misstep. So, and, and hopefully, we will have matured somewhat beyond that. You know, but I guess time will tell. So, well, if I, if I might add one other thing on that, Tony, the yeah. one part that I think well, the research is showing us too, though, is that once you start getting some public attitudes involved and the opportunity for everyday consumers to access space, right, this changes the dynamic quite a bit from our kind of traditional silos in government, looking at governments interacting with each other, the mm -hmm. more that, that the private sector gets involved the more this game changes quite a bit. And I, right. and I think at Beyond Earth, what one thing that we've noticed um, and that we're, we're hoping is that pushing that forward will yes. actually allow more opportunity and kind of change the narrative from what right. we've experienced in the past, right? If we've taken the same old narratives from the 1960s with Apollo and applying them to the present, we're gonna get what we always got. We have a different, you know, uh, a lot of new entities now on the scene. And so uh, there's an opportunity there with the right policies to really change how the next 5, 10, 20 years will be with space travel. So that's what we're very excited about and moving sure. forward. That shift from nation state activity to commercial activity. So absolutely. So Sean, I wanted to get your uh, input on something that Steve just uh, touched on, which was the, the water resources on the moon. And then there's obviously other resources throughout inner space. And when you look at that, how, what kind of policy recommendation should we make towards enabling the use of those resources, not only in bringing them back to earth, but using them in space? And, you know, how do you determine when ownership takes over, et cetera, et cetera? Absolutely, Tony. That is the, <laughs> that is the million dollar, billion dollar, trillion dollar question, right? Because that has been the one that has perplexed many, right? And, and when we addressed this in our earlier research, right, even all the other experts we put together said, this is a tough one, and we may not need to address it immediately, right? But we know we need to address it eventually, right? And so one of the approaches that, you know, our research has focused on is what, what can we put in place to give some assurance, right? Some of that assurance with the resources that perhaps, I don't wanna say sidesteps the question, but serves as maybe an interim area. And one area that we are exploring and that we're excited about is, is for example, agreeing to some sort of arbitration mechanism as enforcement, right? So you're not, you're not making a, dis a distinction necessarily on the property, but you're determining your relationship with another party, right? Through a contract or through some other means that might avoid some of these more vexing questions that, you know, we have treaties that we have to look into, which, you know, people have different opinions about, uh, but uh, there could be ways that we don't have to say, let's spend the next 10 years figuring this out, right? Let's get the parties involved who we think might be there 
and see if there are some agreements we can make amongst ourselves, right? Not necessarily even getting government regulation involved to move this forward so that people know the rules, right? If people know the rules and people have a way to enforce those rules that they've agreed upon and a mechanism, then, they, then they, the, the involvement might be higher and there might be more willingness to say, let's, let's take that next step forward a little bit here. And, and maybe we can address some of these questions as we get further along. So that's, that's what so I think is a real exciting area of research to kind of move us forward and beyond just feeling like we're always hitting our head against the wall and trying to address that question and, and say, look, let's, get, let's just put, put this together and put it on paper and say, how are everybody going to get to a grade on how we would use this if we actually end up getting there? Okay. And then, Steve, one of the other things that we've been talking about is it's going to, cost, take, it's going to take a lot of resources to build these things. <laughs> Um, any community beyond Earth. So why don't you touch in a little bit about the, the financing mechanisms and the policies surrounding that? Uh, so, you know, it's been, you know, it's been exciting over the last uh, uh, 15, 20 years to see NASA sort of switch to being a partner, um, establishing more uh, public-private partnerships with SpaceX. Um, there's a great story about how um, how the Falcon was developed on uh, a relative shoestring compared to what NASA would have otherwise spent. And I think they're applying that to, um, to getting back to the moon, which is very exciting. Uh, the reality is, however, I mean, true development of the kind of infrastructure that you're looking at to support uh, sustained uh, human activity on, moon, on the moon uh, with a population that is growing over time is going to require a kind of finance levels that are going to you know, far exceed anything that we're, we've been used to up to now. And, uh, and we need to be thinking uh, collectively uh, for all the, I'm talking of the, of the stakeholders that are interested in developing the moon, uh, how do we manage the project financing for uh, large-scale infrastructure and large-scale uh, habitat construction, uh, and I, I just as a just a short commercial, we have just <laughs> launched a, an initiative. <laughs> we have just launched an initiative to take a very close look at um, various models that could be employed to um, find do such financing uh, and. Uh, and I, I think for very complex systems uh, and very expensive systems in the hundreds of billions of dollars range, um, we're going to need another level of consideration for how do you manage that risk? How do you spread that risk over time? Um, you know, how do to, how to each of the stakeholders, public and private, and even individual investors kind of have play a role in this kind of uh, construction? Do you create a corporation? That is a uh, government charter to manage all of this activity. Is there is there means by which you could do it strictly from through uh, the private sector means? So uh, we don't have the answers, and we don't <laughs> we don't want to dictate the answers. We want to uh, we want to raise this issue and be and be the and and uh, and and be the ones who are creating a dialogue around this around this uh, question. I think that's a great approach. And I think we're trying to take that approach to everything. So I see by the clock, the time is up. So Steve and Sean, thank you very much for your work and your insights into these policy areas. Um, I know that uh, we will enable and accelerate communities beyond earth as we continue to work at the Beyond Earth Institute. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing those policies through. All right, thank you very much. And thank Thanks, you for- Tony. Thank you, Tony. Welcome back, everyone. I'm pleased to be joined by Carlton Johnson. Uh, he is a Colonel of the United States Air Force, retired. Carlton is also a strategic leadership advisor, cybersecurity expert, and perhaps most importantly, the chairman of the Board of Governors and the National Space Society. Carlton, welcome to the ISDC. Thank you, and uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. This is, I believe, my fourth ISDC. And uh, even though this is a virtual event, it's going to be just as big and as great as it's always been. 
Perhaps more so because you're here now. Yeah. So um, <laughs> we're, we're here to talk about our future in space through the lens of, I guess we'd call it culture. Um, as we move humans into space, one of the big questions we face is what kind of society or societies we're going to have up there. So you and I are both science fiction fans. Yeah. We're both very familiar with what Star Trek's future looked like, and it was a very visionary one that Gene Roddenberry painted for us. It yeah. was a roughly unified society, if you forget the Cardassians, where peace, tolerance, human rights, and personal fulfillment have really conquered most of our petty differences. Yeah. On the other side, we have the future portrayed by another show that we both enjoy called The Expanse, where tribalism, intolerance, and cultural divisions are more heated than ever. Mm. So what kind of future do you foresee if you compare it to your crystal ball? And how do we leave some of these less noble instincts behind us? Yeah, this is interesting. And I think about this a lot because, you know, as you said, when you look at the Gene Roddenberry version, you know, the thing that is not talked about a lot, you know, they allude to it in different episodes, is it took them a while to get there. You know, it was the 23rd century, uh, Kirk side. And then the 24th century, you know, as you go to Picard, and they seem to become even more civilized then, but they still had more challenges as well. Uh, the thing that I think is consistent is as we go forth and then humanity expands outward, you know, the thing that stays with us is us, you know, uh, the things that make us human. So you have to change the human condition and evolve the human condition. And, and the really nice thing is that we have that, cool thing called freedom of choice. We have the right to choose what we want to do differently. So shows like uh, Star Trek, as an example, show that when you make those type of choices and you work in collaboration, there's opportunities. Uh, the show The Expanse has an example. Uh, it's not in the 23rd century. It's a few years back. And so I submit that that's probably closer to where we will be initially. And as we go forth into the social system, we're, we're just going to have to learn some lessons and how to work better together because space is hostile, space is difficult, space is challenging. And as we go out there for the first few years, yeah, it's gonna be like I used to do when I went deployed. Uh, you're gonna take what you need, you're gonna to have to survive off of that, and you're gonna to have to build off of that. And that's a harsh living environment. It takes a special kind of person to do that. As you now go from location or site to uh, settlement to, I'll use the word colony, to nation state, whether it be on Luna, uh, on Mars, or in between, now you start bringing those other civilized uh, uh, elements in, and you have to look at social issues, po po uh, politics, and all that. So I just, I submit to you, Rod, that uh, we're, we still have a lot to learn, but as we move forward, we can learn from these things that we've seen in the past and make the choice to make it better than what we have. So, so I guess we look at a couple of examples. I can think of, of especially if you're talking about planetary uh, settlements, the Antarctic situation. So we've got countries that have different bases all around the perimeter and in the interior. And then we have the U.S. run Scott Abinson base at the uh, actual South Pole, mm -hmm. where these various communities come together and work shoulder to shoulder. But at the end of the day they almost always retreat back to their national territories, if you will, since it's a little piece of their country on the Antarctic ice. So there seems to be this comfort level of working in collaboration and shoulder to shoulder, and then perhaps the sense of relief, okay, I can go back to my people, I can eat the food I like, speak the language I'm used to, crack the jokes I'm used to, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. So that's one model. Then we see the International Space Station which is our only real example of, of extended international cooperation in space, which has worked well. Unfortunately, China wasn't included, mm. but uh, Russia was. And even when we were having difficulties with Russia over the Ukraine incursion, we were still working collaboratively on the space station. So whether we're talking about, and maybe it's different in free space versus planetary and lunar, colon, uh, lunar settlements, but how do you see those different things playing out and, and what will the effects be? You know, I think you keyed in on it and, you know, to, you know, to use a uh, older term, location, location, location. You know, when you're on Earth, in this case, uh, and 
at the Antarctic or at South Pole, you can go back. I mean, literally, you're a few hours away by a plane or what have you. Uh, so it, I guess the way to look at this is uh, you, you do have something to go back. You know you're going to be able to go back. Uh, there's an analogy I use, and I have to say, uh, I'm a little sad to say that I don't know the exact origin about what I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. There was a um, situation where uh, when uh, I think it was uh, Cortez, when he came to the New World, he burnt all the boats. And that was to give his people incentive. You know, once you are kind of all in, you just kind of do it. Yeah. In the space station, you're all in. You know, you're all working together. Uh, you, you can't go downtown for McDonald's, what have you. You can't go get whatever you're going to eat. So you have to collaborate. And because of all the challenges that exist and the dangers that exist in space, uh, I, I think that collaboration of uh, that idea of working together is forged, uh, if you will, in fire and steel, or in this case, the cold space. So let's talk about cultures for a moment and 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 coexistence. So um, I was in a seminar a while back where we were talking about how different cultures might comfortably exist side by side in these very harsh environments. And I think a lot of us, I think you included, uh, foresee the first decade or so of of off planet settlement as as lo looking largely like either. Not, not being a military operation, but looking like one, it's just the necessities. Yeah, we don't have a lot of ferns hanging on the walls and and you know motivational posters. We've we've kind of got things that look like oil rigs in the North Sea or, or or something of that nature. So, given that the environments can be very challenging and we need to work together, if you have somebody from a culture, let's say that needs to pray multiple times a day, so they need to take a break and they need to be in a specific location and they need to be pointing a certain direction. Um, you know, astronaut time on any any station is really expensive. How does that factor into how we're going to govern life in in these outposts? Do you think? You know, that's and that's something I've recently written about, and I'm glad you brought that up because I'll, I'll use the uh, pending and hopefully soon. Uh, traverse will do to Mars when we get the uh, first humans on Mars. Uh, again, if memory serves, that's a nine month trip, one way, 18 month round trip. And we're going to have to not only look at uh, you know, equipping those people to survive, because as you know, radiation and everything is a lot different when you're getting to that location, but being very uh, thoughtful and strategic about not only who we select to go, but why. You know, in case in point, if you, you have to, do, you have to consider the religious implications. You have to consider the social implications. Um, uh, again, trying to be agnostic uh, in terms of a particular sect, but using this as an example, if you have a society whereby uh, men and women typically don't work together, you know, there are clear uh, demarcation between what they do. Yeah. Well, if you're going to have a crew that may have uh, mixed uh, nationalities, you have to consider that. And so it's interesting that as we talk about space exploration and space development, those things don't typically come to the forefront. It's all about the science. We're gonna have to look at the ethics. We're gonna have to look at the societal issues, the religious implications, all of that needs to go into mission planning uh, for the trip itself. And then once you get to the location as well. So. Absolutely. And this is one of the things I like about NSS. We're looking at that issue uh, as, as a group of people who are interested in space, but have a the people's voice, if you will. And we have the ability to inform uh, these type of conversations, either through papers, discussions like we're doing today. Uh, and I submit that if we don't do it, who will? So this is it's very timely that you bring that up. And one of the reasons I think ISDC is very important. So in a, I'm going to take a step back to a less formalized uh, discussion of, of culture or tribalism or whatever you want to call it. I, I think that term is kind of out, of out of vogue at the moment. But if you've got a, let's say, a larger settlement where you have people, you've got the scientists, you've got the engineers, you've got the technicians, you've got people just taking care of logistics and so forth, there seems to be, at least on Earth, this tendency for people of like backgrounds to to clump together and kind of pull away from, from the group yeah. to an extent. 
whether it's just for for social time or what have you, sometimes those divisions can become somewhat abrasive mm -hmm. from one side or the other or both. So is that something that we should encourage or is that something that we should try to, and, and is it our right to, try and keep people more integrated and less divided by these cultural or national or tribal divides? That's a hard question. It's, you know, it's kind of the idea, do you let it happen organically or do you take an inorganic approach to, to, to forge that? Um, and I, I'd say either way is difficult. Number one, as you're looking at the initial mission set, okay, the initial days, you're going to have specialized skill sets doing specialized things. And, and uh, again, because there has to be a, uh, at least right now, a return on investment for what we do in space, you know, there's got to be that conversation of for every dollar, for every minute you spend doing something, there's going to be an experiment, uh, a capability that the taxpayers who are funding that, if it's funded by governments, they're going to want to know what you've invest, invested your, uh, their money in. Um, where I, I see this maybe changing a little bit is as commercial space starts to take up more uh, of a presence. Now you get that uh inorganic, or I should say organic uh, evolution that you're talking about. Because if you're looking at it from a national perspective, I submit that it'll probably be very rigid, very regimented, because that's that's the way it works. I mean, you know, that's yeah. how it is. But uh, on the commercial side, uh, not as many rules as long as you're keeping people safe and people are uh, more likely to be innovative. So people going on those missions, I submit, might be in addition to specialized skill sets, those dreamers, shapers, movers, and makers, those artists, those uh, musicians, and so forth. Uh, do they have a role in space? I, you know, people can argue yes or no. Uh, I submit that when you look at, um, I, and I, I again, I'll, I'll defer to uh, fact on who the individual was or is, but you have uh, billionaires saying, hey, uh, I'll fund for different people to go out there. Okay, and that's because they see that. They don't want this to just be a national effort. So I think what's going to happen is you're going to see both inorganic and organic uh, evolution of uh, societal interfacing and teaming. And if, as long as we let it happen like that, we'll see how the two will come together uh, as we get in various locations throughout the solar system. Well, so you've, you've you brought up an interesting point about organic versus inorganic. So you have had a career in the military. Yeah. Where you face a lot of the same issues we're talking about within a, a unit of, of troops. And the military, which is a very top down regimented system, by and large, as far as I know, but you'd know much better, kind of leaves this whole discussion of cultural differences and ethnic differences and so forth largely to resolve itself. Does that work? And would that work out there in the same way? Again, another tough question. I, the, the challenge or the difference in terms of doing this, if this were, say, like a military operation, again, you have a mission, you have an objective. Uh, usually you're going out because something bad has happened and you need to do uh, the right thing to make the bad go away. Um, in certain situations, you don't have time to argue. You, uh, you, you just need to get it done, and you know you don't have a lot of time for a discussion. Uh, there are other times where, yeah, you, know, you, you can. So as I look at, again, those initial days, I think it's going to be predicated on, again, what is the mission? You know, if you're going out to uh, do exploration, well, that's a scientific thing. Uh, but as you now fast forward that, and you're actually looking at commerce, okay? And you have commerce, say, between the Earth and the Moon, as an example, and different way stations along the way. Uh, those commerce routes need to be protected. So you'll have certain entities that are focused on doing things that fall into that regimented discipline method, uh, and you have others who will have a different way of, of doing it. Uh, I, but I think in the initial days, you'll have to have a certain level of discipline going forth 
because it, uh, without, and hopefully I don't uh, offend anybody, but what I'm about to say, some things can't be too loosey-goosey when you're out there working in that harsh environment. There have to be some things that you do in a specific way. Uh, but as you learn from that and you improve, now you can innovate. So there's, again, a balance. Well, I guess I, I hope, and I think we all hope that this that the mission orientation will take precedent and and help us to learn how to get along better. But at the same time, when you're when you're out somewhere for a very long period of time, mission I think tends to become a more abstract, long term concept, and day to day living begins taking over your thinking. So we'll we'll hope that we get more of Star Trek and less of the Expanse, or <laughs> for those of us of a certain generation, Outland. Which was uh, oh man, you're dating, a much dating us darker now. side. <laughs> because you know, and it's an interesting topic. I mean, we're talking now about um, when people are engaged in their work, but during downtime, yeah. How much tolerance do you have for different kinds of recreation, both legal and not? Yeah. Um, because the illegal activities or contraband or whatever you want to call it can affect job performance and we're in an environment, uh, you know, more dangerous than a nuclear submarine and your deployments in, in the Middle East where one misstep can vent the atmosphere out of a spacecraft. So how do we, how do we circle that? You know, it's, it gets back to what is the nature of the society that you are building in a location? I, you mentioned Outland and that's one of my old favorite movies from back in the day. A uh, little gritty, but you know, look at what they were doing. They were mining on, uh, I believe, it was Io or Europa, Ganymede or something. Yeah, yeah. And so they are they're, they're miners. You know, rough and tough and hardy, uh, work hard, play hard. And so they had certain types of entertainment that were kind of allowed. Now, you know, you know, moral society is that something that you want to do? It's a conversation. You know. Uh, if you say to like a military guy like me, no, <laughs> you know, that's not something we want to do. However, <laughs> the other side, you know, when, when you get out there, things are just different when you're on the frontier. So, and, and I stretch on this one a little bit because part of me, the, the part of me that is the discipline side, the, the part that follows rules and regulations, you know, there are certain things I just think you don't want to do out there in space, you know, uh, Others may have a different view. What's got to happen though, Rod, is this. Uh, when you are looking at establishing those type of settlements and you, and you hit on something very important, what is the rule of law? You know, how do you establish that? And how do you enforce that when you are literally geographically separated from Mother Earth? Uh, you have to have certain principles in place. Those principles we choose to take out with us will define that. And uh, once again, to your point, uh, if we don't take consideration for the different ways that people do things, entertain themselves and so forth, I think we will find ourselves in a very dangerous situation uh, because uh, not having the right behaviors can affect the entire settlement. So there's got to be a conversation about the rule of law on these locations and how that manifests itself. Absolutely. Well, this has been really fascinating. Um... We have a lot of people from a lot of different countries, a lot of different age groups, a lot of different backgrounds watching. Do you have a message of, of hope for them? Yeah, I, I'll tell everybody, listen, it, this is an exciting time. You know, and the things we're talking about, these are hard to topics. You know, uh, when we go into space, again, I, I'm a fan of the scientific exploration. I'm a fan of getting out there and learning, but it's also about getting out there and living. When we talk about living, it includes all the things we have to manage and quote unquote, deal with here. So I encourage everybody to have a voice in this conversation, you know, uh, step forward, share your ideas uh, to include what are the type of behaviors you expect us to have out there and the things we want to bring with us, you know, the art, the music, along with the science. So join in, in that conversation and leverage your time here at ISDC to expand those conversations and uh, help us to find better ways to communicate the story of how we're going to go out and live and operate in space and uh, you know, be part of that conversation, help us do that. Uh, so thanks a lot for what you're doing. And I'll just add, if you're not a member of the National Space Society, what you just heard are all the good reasons for joining to become part of this conversation. So Carlton, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure and we'll be back shortly. Thank you, Rob. Have a good day.
We're building a town on the moon as a game world. It has high technical and scientific realism. Hundreds of people can be there together. It will evolve as players add to it. And it's for you. Find out more at moonwords.com. My name is Hank Rogers. Um, I come from the game industry, but uh, today I'm talking about my mission number three, which is to make a backup of life on Earth by going to the moon and other planets. Uh, the obvious uh, starting point is the moon because it's only three days, days away by 60s technologies. But where are, where are we going to practice to go and build something on the moon? Today, I'm going to make the case that uh, a mountain called Mauna Loa in Hawaii, slide please, uh, is the perfect place to study how to build things on the moon and Mars. Well, first of all, the Earth is made out of two kinds of crust, uh, uh, continental and oceanic. Hawaii is oceanic crust, and the moon and Mars are oceanic crust. That means the rock of Mauna Loa is 96% chemically the same as the rocks on Mars and the moon. And uh, by the way, uh, the red color is iron oxide oxidizing, which is what, what gives uh, Mars its red color. So Mauna Loa, uh, first of all, is the, geologically the closest. We also have lava tubes. Um, slide, please. That is an example of a lava tube. This is taken on, on Mauna Loa, and in the background you see Mauna Kea, where all the, the telescopes are. But you can see how big they get. Um, so the geology is there, meaning moon and Mars also have, uh, lava tubes and people think that we're going to stay in them. I beg to disagree. We'll see that later. But, um, in any case on Mauna Loa, we built a, um, test site called high seas, the Hawaii, um, space exploration, analog and simulation. Yeah, so um, uh, High Seas, uh, which is the Hawaii um, Space Exploration Analog and Simulation, uh, was originally a project with NASA to figure out how to live on Mars. <clears throat> Six uh, astronauts were to spend long periods of time uh, in a small space. And so this, uh, we're, we have 1,200 square feet inside the dome. And um, basically when... Um, astronauts, habinauts, whatever you want to call them, and crew are in sim, uh, which can be anywhere from one week to 12 months. Uh, if they go outside after the sim has started, they have to wear a spacesuit. So, and it's a full EVA with somebody left behind to communicate with them, um, audio. And um, so six people living in 1,200 square feet. And we fought with NASA on the design because... You know, if you're going to go on a 22-month mission, this is eight months to go to Mars, six months to stay while you, the Earth comes around, and another six months to go back. That's 22 months. That's what they were testing for. I say we need to have some serious creature comforts in there uh, because this is going to be the most expensive mission ever, and we don't want people killing each other on the way. Um, so next, next uh, slide. So this is a um, wide angle shot of the inside of the dome. 
Um, this is taken from one of the workstations. We have six workstations in, a, in an open space. And up there on the second floor, you see this, the, the, there are seven doors, six crew, and one um, water closet, although there's no water in our water closet. Um, so one of the things that we changed about the, the NASA design was uh, that we gave each, each crew a door that they could walk through into their own sp space and stand inside and change their clothes. The original NASA design was something like slide in sleep quarters. And so then it, it means no privacy at all. So here we give each crew member a little bit of privacy. And down below, you can see there's a kitchen um, and um, a kitchen with uh, freeze dried food. I'll get to the food in a bit. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, I'll talk about a little bit of the energy system. Um, what you're seeing, what you're looking at here is batteries um, and inverters and, and charge controllers. We basically um, have a solar array outside which charges the batteries so that the crew can make, uh, can have 24-7 uh, elect electricity, all solar. Now, if there is a, re uh, a few days of darkness and we don't get enough power, we, we have, as a backup, we have hydrogen. So we have a fuel cell and the hydrogen then uh, goes through the fuel cell, makes electricity, charges the batteries, and so that's the backup. The future is um, if we have excess energy during the day cycle, say we wake up in the morning, we know it's gonna be a clear day and the batteries are at, I don't know, 70%. We can use that and say, make more hydrogen. So we can make our own backup fuel. Um, next slide, please. Food, freeze dried. Um, the first mission that NASA even did uh, in the hab was a, a food mission. Um, compare um, meals ready to eat with ingredients and ingredients won by a mile uh, because there's so many interesting things that people just do with ingredients. Um, we even posted what the ingredients were on, on the internet and people sent us recipes. Uh, so that was kind of fun. Uh, next slide. Um, this makes a huge difference. Even a little bit of salad added to the meal, it's a fresh vegetable and you can watch it grow. So, so this is what we did in the last, uh, the last two missions. We had them grow salad while they're in, on mission. They were like two week missions. Big hit, big hit. And I was, I was thinking, oh, that's so, such a little bit. No, big hit. So when we actually go to the moon and Mars, we are going to have to have some fresh vegetables for those Poor bastards, they can't just eat freeze-dried food for two years. Um, next slide. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so the suits. So our assumption is that there is going to be a comfortable suit ready by the time we go to the, we actually go to the moon. So the body part, um, we just use a comfortable suit. Because if we, if we try to get people to go out in anything that looks anything like uh, the suits that they wore on the moon, you, you would fall over and get punctured immediately. I mean, the, the, the lava here is fresh and jagged. So um, you do not want to be in an inflatable. Um, this is the old suit. Those are um, motorcycle helmets with um, air, um, how can I say, pumps in the back. We actually have a little uh, cooler in each backpack. Um, and that keeps the, uh, the, the helmets from fogging up. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so our, pro our big problem is, is communication. Um, I want video on every crew member so we can watch um, what they're doing live. And so for that, we need repeaters. Uh, and the problem is um, just, uh, the, the communication is still the problem, is, is my bottom line. We can get good audio. And, but the video is not that good. Next slide. Okay, this is, uh, this is an example where uh, communication with uh, base camp completely fails. Um, this is um, some crew members in a lava tube. Um, some of them are big enough to stand in, but others are crawl spaces. And I've been in a bunch of missions where we actually have to squeeze through the rock, you know, with our head sideways to be able to get through. 
Um, and yeah, so the stuff needs to be pretty tough. Next. Yeah, so here's the air handler in the back. Um, and you can see the giant uh, lava tube in the distance there. Next. Right. Um, so the, the thing that, oh, did I forget that picture? No. Oh. Um, the camera is actually mounted below her nose. So there's a white little dot there. That white dot is the camera. Um, and then we have light, of course. Next slide, please. And each crew have a head-up display built into uh, the helmet. And that um, basically what we do is we either do uh, Google Maps, so you know exactly where you are and where you're going. Uh, this is how I navigate anyway. I usually have a, an iPhone in my hand, and I'm looking around with an iPhone trying to find the entrance to lava tubes. They are very hard to find because there's no rhyme or reason for their location. Uh, next slide. This is uh, mission control. Um, we have back at the ranch, so to speak, we have the, the vision is to have one screen for every crew member live. Um, not all the time, not during that, but I'm during EVA so that we can track what everybody's doing. Just like in, I think it's Aliens 2. So this is, this is mission control. Next. And this is what um, our dream is. Our dream is to create a facility on the Big Island um, to be part of a lunar university. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking for about a thousand acres. I wanted no vegetation, if at all possible, so <clears throat> we can actually build anything. And the idea is to set up an R&D R &D facilities and, <clears throat> and then build prototypes. You can see in the distance we are building prototypes. So robotically, whatever it takes, we need to prototype what we're going to do on the moon. And this is where I propose to do it. There are lava tubes uh, in this thousand acres, I would expect. And so we can even practice doing stuff in lava tubes. These are all things that we need to learn before we actually go to the moon. Um, the future is <clears throat> um, a moon base on the moon. I'd like to see it uh, by 2030. Uh, the way I look at it is you've got all these billionaires building airplanes and no one's building airports. So what's wrong with this picture? I bet there's going to be a billionaire out there who says, you know what? Airports make money. Uh, I'll build an airport on the moon. So um, we can start off with a small replica of what we're using right now, which is six people. Um, but we can add and add and add just like the International Space Station. And I believe that they're all going to be domes because they're the most efficient way of building structures still yet. Nobody's come up with something better. So um, see you on the moon at Mahina Lani, on Mahina Lani. Mahina is the moon in Hawaiian, and Lani is heaven. So we're talking about moon heaven on the moon, 2030. See you there. Hello, I am Dr. Barbara Imhof. I'm a space architect. I'm also the co-managing director and co-founder of Liquify Systems Group. And we are based in Vienna, a transdisciplinary team with a focus on systems design, space architecture, and uh, exploration infrastructure. And we work for the European Space Agency and as part of the a European framework program and also for other industry clients for um, new space missions. The topic is space architecture around and on the moon. So I'd like to present you a snapshot of our portfolio and I'll get right into matters. Uh, the first one is a very recent current one we are working on. It is the Gateway Project. I'm sure you're familiar with that. It is the next international space station to be uh, orbiting the moon. And um, we are working on the um, IHAP, the International Habitat Module. You see that this project is a truly international project as the International Space Station. It's um, comprising um, contributions from NASA, from ESA, the European Space Agency, for which we are working, uh, from um, JAXA, Japanese Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, and possibly also 
Roscosmos. And we have been tasked to develop the interior for the habitation module. So that part where the astronauts will spend a considerable time on board. The mission of Gateway is to um, be a sort of relay station and allow for um, descent onto the lunar surface for further lunar moon surface exploration. And what you see here is, since this project is still under development, what you can see here is um, a configuration which is maybe not the latest, but it is representative. And there's this big long arm that comprises also of the lunar lander. So four astronauts are supposed to live on this station up to uh, a month. It is much further out than uh, the International Space Station. So there's a lot of uh, new requirements and um, it's also a sort of deep space mission already and it prepares us for um, transits to Mars. So this is the interior of the uh, International uh, Habitat module. It is um, in five meter in length. And uh, right now this is a slightly bigger, but it's approximately three meters in diameter. This was a, a earlier version. You see here, we have uh, different uh, functions. You see the control station or the science uh, section. And um, then we also will take a look into the different systems. Um, and um, you'll see that here on the animation, we need a lot of storage and, uh, for supplies, for food, uh, uh, you know, for everything you'll need during a one month mission. Um, we have a galley with a food warmer and you know, a trash compartment, um, but we also have a galley table for social gathering for people, the crew coming together and having dinners. For example, it is uh, deployable as many of these items need to be because we have a very tight space. Here you see a concept for the deployability of crew quarters. So they have, for each of the crew members, there's an individual private cabin and um, to save space and to make it multifunctional, there are different extensions and um, sort of deployability being planned in. So here's the science section with the glove box, with the freezer, um, and um, also the different equipment or experiments and the uh, control station. There's also a large extent goes into the system and into the life support system. So you see that it takes up a lot of space. Um, also needs, everything needs to be doubled for safety reasons. And when we you know, take a look into that habitation module, you can already see that there's a lot of overlayering of different functions. You see a um, person exercising another one at the science uh, equipment, at the glove box, and um, it's quite um, tight. Um, and our speciality is um, the transformation of spaces. So here the galley table deploys and allows for um, a social gathering. So now when we think about what, how could we sort of start uh, with a little bit on the surface, with surface um, exploration, maybe we have a tiny little outpost for short duration stay. Uh, this was one of our projects. Uh, we also built a prototype. It was called the SHE habitat. The SHE stands for self-deployable habitat for extreme environments. And it was uh, developed as part of, of the European Framework project with uh, other consortium members, so other partners, which all projects are um, multi-partner projects we are doing. Um, you see here how the, again, how important it is to create deployable um, habitats or spaces. So here you see uh, that the she habitat uh, comprises of a core and then of petals, six petals, which can deploy. So in that way, it can also function as a simulation facility for training astronauts on Earth. But when later developed, it could also fit into a large rocket fairing, two of them back to back. So you could already extend the, the space. Um, here you see a deployable uh, or a sequence of um, uh, how the, the habitat deploys with these different petals. 
It is meant for um, a surface stay for two weeks for uh, two people. So if we have two, then we could have a four person crew. You see that also the, all the interior needs to be deployable. This is the middle space, the sort of communal space, the galley. But it also has, of course, private spaces for personal retreat, personal items. And each of the two crew members, they can have their own individual cabin. It's also foreseen in the larger uh, petal area to have um, uh, work uh, zones um, so that um, with different light conditions, with acoustic paneling, because you know life support systems here in the middle are always quite loud. Um, and um, in the middle is also um, the galley located. And the communal zone with the control panel. We built this as a demonstrator and, in, and it has been used as a simulation facility as well. This can also serve as an extreme habitat, extreme environment habitat on Earth for remote locations. Um, and um, of course, it can also serve as a first habitat on Mars. Here you see the uh, hygiene facility and the wet compartment, uh, which can also be used for repairs. For getting in and out of the habitat, uh, we are suggesting suit ports. Um, that is uh, an infrastructure that allows to keep the dust out, which is very important on the lunar surface, but equally important on the Martian surface, where, from which, for which you get a, a, gl a glimpse here. Then uh, another part of uh, surface infrastructure and in a project we worked on we didn't build a prototype, but we made an extensive concept study was a Rama rover for advanced mission applications, which could also be used for the Martian surface. But here's an example for the lunar surface. Um, it was part of an, a larger ESA study. And it was um, a six meter um, sort of, it had a similar volume as she, also um, approximately uh, 50 cubic meters. Um, it's uh, comprised of a suit port as an entrance and exit point um, of uh, life support systems and also a sort of storm shelter. It was also meant for a crew of two uh, for up to two or three weeks of um, mission exploration duration. Mobile infrastructure is very important because we need to increase our distances of exploration at one point. And um, what was also very important here was actually the transformability of the interior space. So we have two uh, seats basically, and these seats, they can do everything. They revolve um, around um, a sort of a middle circle and they can be part of the cockpit, they can be workspace, they can be also used for leisure and relaxation and the table uh, which pulls up here is at the same time the entrance to the crew quarters, which are sheltered a little bit lower, uh, also for radiation protection. But finally, ultimately, when we want to go uh, and live on the lunar surface for longer uh, time periods, we need to look into sufficient shielding. And um, the best way is to take the resources on the lunar surface at hand and to um, you know, maybe use it for 3D printing. And in our case, uh, I'd like to um, here present a um, project for solar sintering uh, of um, infrastructure of habitat shielding, or also what you can see here, shielding for rovers, um, which can be uh, then also protected, um, not only from radiation, but also from micrometeorites. So what is solar sintering? It is actually concentrating the solar beam, which, you know, the sun uh, without any atmosphere, we have uh, like, uh, you know, in abundance on the moon, onto layers of sand to create um, elements, three-dimensional elements uh, interlocking with interlocking capacities to create these habitat structures, but also to center flat ground stabilizing elements. We can create habitat shelters, shelters for infrastructure, mobile infrastructure, 
uh, roads or also launch pad, uh, launch pads and launch pad aprons to prevent the dust uh, from to go everywhere. We, uh, it was also uh, under the lead, or it was under the lead of the German Aerospace Center, and we had three printing campaigns. This was in ambient uh, conditions. Um, you see the actual the table here moving uh, in uh, three dimensions in X, Y, Z axis, and sintering layer by layer uh, these elements. Another printing campaign was to sort of increase the printing uh, volume. Um, it was a, a demonstrator. You can imagine that this sort of a structure could also sit on wheels so that it becomes a mobile structure. It used a different approach, a Fresnel lens, which concentrated the solar beam onto a fixed table to center um, elements. We used a, a lunar a soil simulant JC 2A for that. And the third campaign was in vacuum because we have vacuum on the moon. It's a very specific environment and we also have to develop this technology and to test it in this particular uh, environment. The best samples we got from it, though the technology is not uh, completely flight proven, so there has to there have to be a couple of more steps. Is this uh, sample? You can see that it's still uh, you know bulging, and you see the different layers. So uh, through temperature optimization, we would like in the next steps to uh, improve the technology and make it more ready for flight. So how to create actually a shell, a habitat? Um, we are using uh, sort of two to three meters thick um, regular, regular shells and uh, pressure chambers um, beneath so that um, we only can you know, produce very thin pressure chambers which we take from Earth and everything else we can print on the moon. An ideal shape for the um, regolith that cannot take any tensile strength with purely solar sintering is to look at catenary lines um, because uh, or at 100 degrees turned catenary lines as you can see here on this picture it can only take compression forces uh, a good example is the Sagrada uh, de Familia um, for, by Antoni Gaudi which is produced only uh, you know, by compression forces uh, through this um, model uh, at, without computation. Of course, now we are using computational methods. For the Regolite project, um, we created specific geometries based on uh, space filler um, and dense packing uh, geometries. And in this animation, um, there is, you see the um, sort of path uh, um, platform where um, the pressurized um, modules can be put on and then um, on top of it a two to three meters um, shielding and you also see we're using not only sintered elements but also loose sand um, so that we have to sinter fewer components that saves time. And then one create different kinds of um, shelters, domes that create a larger base. You also see on this picture actually the rover, um, I, Rama rover I was suggesting before. And um, in a distance, you also see how the 3D interlocking elements can be uh, used for a launch pad, which is displayed here. And don't forget, when you're on the moon, uh, take a good look at our um, home planet, the Earth. Thank you for your attention. Who cares about human space exploration? Well, the answer to that question is not enough people. A group called Morning Consult conducted a survey in February of this year and found that only one third of Americans think that sending humans to the moon should be either a top or even an important priority. Um, 
you know, I, I care about human space exploration and you're watching this. So that tells me that you care too. And uh, you and I can make a difference. We can uh, explain to people how much scientists have learned from decades of astronauts living on the International Space Station and how that knowledge benefits not only space travelers, but also people living right here on Earth. We can tell how the <clears throat> uh, limitless resources of the universe can sustain human life indefinitely. We can explain how uh, living in colonies on man-made habitats or asteroids or moons or other planets can ensure the survival of our species. And we can um, open people's minds to the big picture, the intrigue of exploring um, unknown worlds that are so different from our own. And we don't have to do it alone. We can inspire each other and share ideas and information. We can help each other become better presenters and discover new groups to speak to. That's what the National Space Society's Space Ambassadors Program is for. My name is Loretta Hall, and I've been a space ambassador since 2010. We're an active and growing group. We have members in the United States, India, and Europe. The Space Ambassadors Program is uh, designed to help space ambassadors become better presenters. It's a, an important undertaking uh, to generate support for an interest in space exploration. And there are several ways that you can support that important mission. One is to become a space ambassador. Uh, don't be shy about applying. We're looking for um, exper uh, presenters. We're looking for presenters with all levels of uh, experience in public speaking, as long as you're enthusiastic and you'd like to talk about any sort of space related topic that is in keeping with the National Space Society's vision. So you can find you can find all the information about our program and fill out the application form on our web page. Just go to the National Space Society's homepage and select the what we do option at the top of the page. The Space Ambassadors uh, program can assist novice uh, presenters in developing their speaking skills and their slide design skills. We can help, uh, help you figure out what you would like to talk about. If you're not sure, uh, explore the libraries and book reviews on the NSS website. We can help you hone your topic as you decide what you'd like to talk about and what you yourself would like to learn more about. And once you're accepted as a space ambassador uh, candidate, you can have access to examples of presentations given by other space ambassadors. Another way to support the program is to invite speakers from our roster to speak to your group. It doesn't matter if it's not a science or a space related group. Um, I've given successful presentations to groups like civic organizations and even a ladies garden club. Space ambassadors are becoming more proficient and comfortable with presenting online so we can address your group regardless of whether you or your speaker is located. And you can find a list of previously presented topics at our webpage. Another way to support the program is to uh, contribute financially. Space ambassadors do not charge for their presentations. And we do have some expenses for promoting the program and for recognizing noteworthy presenters. You can find information about donating or becoming a sponsor on our webpage. In addition to uh, financial donations, we would also be happy to receive sponsor uh, donations such as a tour of a space company's uh, facilities or uh, merchandise with the company logo. During this conference, you will hear from a variety of current space ambassadors and subject matter experts, and they'll tell you 
why they became space, space ambassadors, and what topics they like to talk about. So we'd love to hear from you. Consider joining us. Thanks. All right, my name is Chris Kapier. I'm Space Ambassador with the National Space Society, and I have a really exciting topic to talk about. Uh, not only how to get in space for professionals, but how high school students get their products into space. There's a program here from NASA Hunch, and uh, the goal of Hunch is here to engage high school students specifically in science, technology, engineering, and math, and do project-based learning. Uh, an unbelievable 642 items have already been produced by different high school students and sent to the International Space Station. Uh, in all told, at least 2,500 students were involved. Now, Hunch does want help, and there are corporations and private foundations, academia, who can help further here support these students do what they do for the International Space Station. Uh, that would be very wonderful. So some of the things that students have done, uh, cargo transfer bags, tool location apps, culinary challenges, yes, they make food for the astronauts, and CAD design and manufacturing. Uh, other things here, stowage lockers, um, further food, handrails. So some of this simple stuff, but I'd like to go right on to a very complex project on the next slide. The uh, International Space Station galley table was made by a couple of schools here in Houston, and that was a two-year project. Obviously, $25 billion do not pay for a galley table, so that had to be retrofitted. And the students engineered this, and this project was controlled by NASA and Lockheed Martin. So they manufactured the table after they designed that, and uh, the high schools had their own machine tools to do this. Some of that, however, was donated by NASA and other companies. Uh, very sophisticated setup here. And then here, finally, the galley table was sent up into space 2016. And we see here a picture of the astronauts here celebrating for the first time with a glass of, I guess, water uh, on their new galley table. Uh, if you look below, there's a YouTube link for those who are interested. And you can see here the feedback from the astronauts on how well they liked their new galley table that was provided to them by high school students for a fraction of a cost of what your professionals would have done. Thank you very much for listening. Hi, everyone. This is Eric Harkleroad. I live near Boston. I'm a lifelong fan of space and science fiction, so it's always good to be part of ISDC. Um, I'm sorry I can't see you in person this year. Uh, for now, I can talk a little bit about what we do in Space Ambassadors and uh, my time in Space Ambassadors. Uh, so speaking about space in your community is a great way to help NSS and gain experience as a speaker and uh, meet interesting people. Um, it's just a really good experience um, if you're looking to help NSS. Um, so I'd highly encourage you to take a look at what we do with Space Ambassadors. Um, our goal is to make the NSS vision a reality and you can help us no matter what your age is or your background or education. Um, what's important is having passion for the vision, uh, making the NSS vision a reality. And what we try to do is connect with our audience when we give these presentations. Um, we want to get them as excited as we are about uh, the, the, the topics and the NSS vision. Um, and the, the, the vision is ambitious and, you know, to, um, to, to make space a place that people can live and work and thrive uh, in a, a positive future for humanity. That's a really big vision. And we need a lot of people involved. And that's what Space Ambassadors is really about. We, we need different nations. We need people of different professions not just engineers, not just scientists or um, people who are space fans today. We need to bring lots of people into the fold. Um, and we need, we need people who think different ways, so different types of opinions. Uh, sometimes we disagree about the vision, uh, but uh, we, you know, that's okay. That's how, we, that's how we move forward and build better ideas. Um, just like in nature, you know, diversity builds strength and resilience. Um, that's what we need. So we need you 
it's like the Uncle Sam, that, that Uncle Sam comic, we need you to be part of this movement. Um, and so one way, connecting with the audience is really important for that. And uh, so one way, do, way we do that is with the um, uh, question and answer portion of our speeches. Um, so that's really, I consider that the, my favorite part where I get to connect with the audience and answer questions. And, and it's just a really good time. Um, it helps us make our talks better also. Um, and for a couple of recent speeches, I had a chance to uh, speak to some international students who are studying here near Boston. And um, they just have really good questions. It's great to hear different perspectives. Um, after I gave a talk about settling Mars, uh, we had one audience member who said, now I know anything is possible in America. And that's just a really good spirit. That's the kind of spirit we need um, for this movement. And um, I also reminded her that we need other countries to be involved. America cannot do this by, by ourselves. Um, we need international cooperation, like we see with the uh, space station program. And, uh, so that's great. That's what we're all about in Space Ambassadors is getting more people involved. And um, so until next time, add Astra uh, to the stars. Uh, we'll see you there soon. Hello, um, my name is Bryce Meyer and I am a space ambassador. And what that means is I'm somebody who goes out there and tells people what it's like to be in space what it might be like for them to work in space and how space affects their daily lives. Why I do space? Well, the big reason is because I have this vision in my head of trillions of happy, smiling babies. And what that means is you can only get to maybe 10 billion, 20 billion on planet Earth. And if we do that, we've chewed up all the resources on this planet. And so my vision is that we will have happy, smiling babies, which means producing self, self producing colonies all over the cosmos, as far as humanity can reach. And this is my big motivation. This is exactly why I do it. I also grew up seeing science fiction and space stuff, and I actually work in the engineering field. So I actually sort of know how some of this would work. And so as a result, I know that space is a long range endeavor. And as a result, if we want sustained expansion into space and all the benefits that come with it, we're gonna to have to work at it with not just the adults, but with the new generations that come forth. So in the next slide, the first argument I usually give right off the bat to adults is this one right here, is your dinner came from space. So what you're seeing here is actually my grandparents' old farm and it's farmed by people using modern technology now. And a modern farmer uses GPS, they use weather data and they use imagery data to figure out where to water, where to use the pesticides, where to use herbicides you know, where to even fertilize. And all that data comes from space right now. And so as a result, you are already doing things in space, whether you know it or not, and you are a beneficiary of space. And that's a pretty easy, easy argument to make right off the bat. So that's the really the first approach is getting them used to the fact that they're already using space in their, in their daily lives. So in the next slide, the other, other tack I take is I go into classrooms and I go into space science centers and I'll do presentations to a lot of general publics and I'll actually help kids with various science STEM type projects. And one of the big ways I do that is I'll use this little prototype you see in front of you. And what this is, is something that they can touch and see. And of course it lights up like something out of a movie. And what that does is bring people in. So this brings in the adults and the kids and they go over and see what is that light up thing. And this thing also bubbles and it has actually its own little yeast bioreactor in it. It has a little algae bioreactor and it has a little hydroponic garden. And so it's a miniature working model of a space farm, but the gist is it, it is a prop. And the prop brings people in over to the table. And then once I get there, I start explaining to them how space works. And if I'm talking to kids, I tell them where their role in space is going to be. And that it doesn't matter if they're gonna be an electrician or if they're gonna be an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, they have a role in our future in space. And as a result, they can do that, right? Now, it doesn't mean that I don't go to adults and explain to them the gist of how space works, right? I go to AIAA conferences and NSS conferences and other forums, and I give the adults the technical spiel on how things work. But the real targeting has to be at these kids. And that's really why I like being a space ambassador because I know I'm inspiring the next generation and I can see their eyes light up. And so that's really the big tack. So overall, it's a lot of hard work. And if you go to the next slide, 
our, my future is one where I see the happy babies everywhere and they have farms out in space. And eventually at some point we have this giant economic food web that can feed back to earth too. And so it's not like the people who stay on earth won't benefit. It's the fact that the settlement will spread humanity far and wide and lead to a much happier synergy across the whole thing with more resources to get to. And, and as a result, it's my role to make that happen. And that's why I'm a space ambassador. Thank you. From this distant vantage point, the Earth might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, 
Everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Hi everyone, welcome. I'm Michelle Hanlon. I'm the president of the National Space Society. Uh, today I have the distinct honor and pleasure uh, and privilege to present the NSS Space Pioneer Award to Dr. Scott Bolton. Scott, thank you for being here with us. The Space Pioneer Awards recognize individuals and teams whose accomplishments have made significant contributions to the development of a spacefaring civilization that will establish communities beyond the earth. Of course, much has already been written about Scott Currently, he's the director of the Space Science and Engineering Division at the Southwest Research Institute. He has 24 years of experience at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, spanning a wide spectrum of management, engineering, and scientific positions for, for planetary missions, including Cassini, Galileo, Voyager, and Magellan, to name just a few. His work with both the Cassini and Galileo missions were the perfect basis for his role as the principal investigator for NASA's Juno mission to Jupiter. Scott, we are thrilled to present the NSS Space Pioneer Award to you for your inspiring accomplishment on the Juno project. Accomplishments, I should say. Um, I wish we could present that lovely trophy to you in person. Um, unfortunately, we can't, but perhaps if you could hold it up so that people can see, you know, it would be, yes. Congratulations. It's a really beautiful award, and I, I want to say how honored I am to accept this on behalf of the entire Juno team. I mean, it really was a gigantic team that made this happen. It's not a one person show in any sense. And, um, and many organizations and institutes uh, across the country and in fact, around the world uh, helped to make this happen. And uh, we're very honored uh, to be recognized by uh, such a great uh, institute as yourself. And we thank you for the award. Well, thank you, Scott. I love that you brought that up because it really talks to the fact that space is is for everyone and the best way to explore space is to broaden the broaden our reach as much as possible and embrace other organizations and countries and as many individuals as we can. Um, I think that's one of the biggest and most important messages we have at the National Space Society is to uh, just let's let's share our passion for space. Um, and so with that, I know everyone, the, I'm just so delighted to be here with you and I'm uh, thank you for spending some time with us. Um, let's get to the fun part and actually talk about this, some of the stuff you've done. Um, I've been on the website, I've been watching videos, um, I've been uh, following the program as it, as, it, as it grew. And one of the things that um, really fascinates me is the length of time that it has taken for you to get to this place. I mean, this wasn't like you started this last year, right? No, in fact, uh, it's like takes in a generation. I mean, I, uh, myself and most of my team members, you know, basically watch your kids grow up <laughs> in, during one mission. And um, so we started thinking about uh, Juno and kind of creating the concept way back around 2000. In fact, uh, it was somewhat motivated by some inspiration we had for, by, when Cassini flew by Jupiter way back in 2000 on its way to Saturn. And uh, from there, we built and developed the concept and uh, eventually led to a proposal that went into NASA around 2004. And uh, once we were selected and awarded and, and on our way, uh, you had to build and design it. It finally launched in 2011 um, and, uh, and arrived at Jupiter in 2016. So it's a, it's a long wait. In this business, you have to be very patient. Things don't happen overnight. 
And Jupiter's pretty far away. It's not like going to the moon. I mean, when you launch in 2011 and you don't get there to 2016, it's, it's kind of a long wait. Um, but like everything great in life, I look back and my whole team is sort of like this. We look back and we think, wow, now it seems like it happened so fast. Like, you know, what happened to the time? Um, of course, our kids, you know, who were five years old are now 15 or 20. Um, but you say that about your family too. If you have kids, you look back and you go, seemed like it was going so slow. And then all of a sudden they're grown up. I can't imagine the anticipation waiting all those years. Uh, did you did you lose sleep like every night? I mean, to think about, is it gonna work? Is it, I mean, I just thinking about um, the two uh, vehicles we have spacecraft that are on Mars right now and the waiting to see if the landing was gonna work. I mean, that's a long time to think of all the things that can go wrong with your mission. Yeah, I mean, when I started, my hair wasn't nearly as gray, <laughs> um, but, uh, the concerns don't don't ever go away. I mean, and, and they actually just keep getting uh, bigger. You know, when you're first designing it and developing it, your biggest concern is, oh, uh, I'm going to run out of time. I'm going to try to invent a widget that takes longer than uh, than I predicted, and then I'm going to run out of budget and something bad's going to happen. You know, or NASA won't be able to do this. Um, and then as you get past those milestones and you realize it's going to work, that part of it, you then have to start thinking about the launch. And uh, of course you're on top of a giant firecracker. They don't always go perfectly as planned. And so that was probably the biggest nail biting uh, time up till then where we were really, I was very concerned and worried about launch even though I was also excited. It's a real mixture of emotions, right? You're incredibly excited at the launch but at the same time, everything's riding on it. And, um, and I remember at the launch, uh, you know, when it, the rocket finally went up and we saw that it was successful and you, you're watching it with everybody else go into the sky and I'm getting reports that, you know, we're, we're uh, separated and things are working well. And uh, I'm kind of rubbing my eyebrows or, you know, my forehead like this. And um, the one of the heads of NASA turned to me and he goes, you're not out of the woods yet. The solar arrays have to open. And I said, yes, I know that. <laughs> um, and of course, what he was what he was referring to was the, the solar rays had to unfurl, and that essentially starts the lifeblood right through the spacecraft. Up till then, you're on this battery that's going to run out in just a couple hours. So it was a very big nail biting moment. Uh, we made it through, and then uh, then came crews. There were a couple of times there where I was nervous, um, but the biggest time is when you arrive at Jupiter because then another major critical event has to occur. It's in the blind. You've got to face the rocket, the, uh, the, the spacecraft the right way. So the rocket engine is gonna you know, fire and, and slow you down basically so that you're captured into Jupiter orbit. And that has to go just right. And if it doesn't, you fly right past Jupiter. And so then again, everything's riding on this one moment. We call it Jupiter orbit insertion. And that happened on July 4th, 2016. So that was again, a mixed set of emotions. You're excited. You're excited about July 4th in general. I, I like fireworks, part of the reason I like rockets. <laughs> and, um, but you know, it was very nervous, uh, nerve wracking. And uh, the entire team is there and everybody's waiting. And I was, you know, had to explain to my kids, you know, who had grown up waiting for it. You know, this, if it doesn't go right, it's all over. <laughs> you know, trying to prepare them just in case. Yeah. Um, but everything worked perfectly. And, um, and of course, the, there's still risk. Your Jupiter is a very hazardous environment. But every time we go around in orbit, we get this incredible data. And, um, and it's another thing to relax and say, God, we did it great. Uh, I never quite take it for granted and get used to it. I don't think anybody on the team really does. But um, it's part of the game. You, you, you take risks to reach out and learn about the solar system and about ourselves and how planets work and um, and the payoff's huge when it works. So thinking about that um, and and uh, I know we've, we've got many things to talk about, but I wanna start with sort of why Jupiter? You know, what, why is Jupiter important to us? What 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 is so special about Jupiter um, that, uh, that makes this mission that much more unique and important? So um, Jupiter is the largest of all the planets. Uh, in fact, it's uh, it's so big um, that all the other 
planets in the solar system could fit inside of it. And you and and you still wouldn't have used it all up. And so, um, and in this case, uh, sometimes size matters in the sense that um, because it took up it, it's so large and it and it has most of the material left over after the sun forms. Um, most scientists believe it probably formed first. Okay. And so, when you want to learn about how planets are made and and the recipe for building a solar system, um, Jupiter kind of represents that very first step. And so understanding what it's like inside, what how the interior is structured, uh, whether there's a core in the center of it, or is it is it built with no core? Um, how much, what's the composition like? Um, how is it similar or different than the sun? Your theories have to explain all of that. And then once you figure out Jupiter, you then can move on to the next planets and start to understand how you build the rest of the solar system. So Jupiter is very important in the sense of, of representing that, that process of how you build solar systems, not only ours, but as we discover other solar systems, the extra solar systems that we're now being able to see with telescopes also have to be explained. And then the and a same theory has to work everywhere. Um, Jupiter also plays a very important role in the sense that um, it governed the dynamics of the early solar system. So many models and scientists have, that have uh, many models that scientists have worked on have Jupiter playing a very critical role in the delivery of the volatiles and the things that eventually led to not only Earth being created, but maybe life being started here. You know, the components of the organics and the water and things like that that we think might be important to the beginning of life. Um, and then Finally, um, you know, comparative study is very important and Jupiter has a giant magnetosphere, a giant magnetic field, has very powerful aurora. When you learn about it and you compare it to other planets, Saturn, uh, Uranus, Neptune, Earth, um, and you, you look for similarities and differences uh, and try to understand the theories. But the, the bottom line is Jupiter is really important and has this very primary role in uh, exploration because uh, it was probably formed first. So basically, you could have the, the keys to the life, the universe, and everything um, right there in Jupiter. So um, that is Douglas Adams, my, my favorite science fiction author. Um, so I'm, I'm betting the answer is not 42. Um, I know you've discovered so much, but I want to talk a little bit about the pictures because there are so many stunning pictures that Juno has sent back to us. Um, and I wonder if you could share some of your favorites with us. Absolutely. Um, let me start by just telling you about uh, the camera. So here you see a picture of, uh, of Jupiter and right away you realize that um, it's a perspective that we can't see from the Earth. And uh, you would, if you looked at that and you saw the great red spot like that, even though it's in the wrong spot from what you're used to, you probably could recognize that it's Jupiter. But there are other photos that I'll show that you wouldn't necessarily know were Jupiter. This one's interesting in, in right away when you're going over the poles, which is what Juno does, it, it orbits over the poles and it's the first spacecraft to do that. We saw um, perspectives that we couldn't otherwise see, right? And so here you're seeing part of the polar region and you see the familiar zones and belts or stripes that you normally see around Jupiter aren't really present at the poles and it's replaced by this uh, sort of a bluish toned set of cyclones and storms and vortex storms uh, that are all over the place. And that was a big surprise to us. So this picture represents one of the first pictures that we got where we went, wow, uh, we'd never seen that perspective before. And it, we never would have guessed Jupiter looked quite like that. Um, one of the interesting things about the camera that we have is that um, we put it on there uh, not as a science instrument, but because we all wondered what the pole of Jupiter would look like. Nobody had ever seen it. And we set it up so that the, the, uh, a website would, would broadcast our data. Um, and we would take basically uh, the raw data and not in picture form, put it on the website, advertise it to the public and citizen scientists all around the world, we hoped would come in and make the pictures. We gave them a few directions, but we didn't give them uh, pictures to start with where all they did was change the colors. We basically gave them raw data that didn't look like a picture. And they make all these pictures, all the ones I'm gonna show, plus there are thousands on our website. Uh, many of them are artistic, some are science, some are just beautiful things like this. And um, 
They're all made by uh, everyday people, school children, uh, some engineers, some artists, uh, people that, uh, you know, from all walks of life get involved in this and it's really great. Um, and some of them even make uh, beautiful videos out of them. So this picture is one of my favorites because it's um, a completely different view than you think of when you think of Jupiter. And I think that's an important lesson to us all about um, how perspective, how the perspectives that you're used to govern your thinking. And when you see a different perspective, uh, it opens your mind. So I don't know which is more stunning, this this photo or the fact that it's created by normal people, you know, without uh, who aren't necessarily en engineers and scientists and that that you were able, that you are giving this data out there, putting it out there freely for people to to work with. Um, I think it's just a, an incredible story. And the picture is, is um, I think you said it best, the, the perspective uh, is one of those things that, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a scientist or engineer myself, but just um, putting that different perspective on things is something that space is really important for um, in terms of putting a different perspective on our own lives and our own humanity. Um, so thank you that this picture is, is phenomenal. Then you had some more as well. Yeah, well, let me show one other another, another one. Um, I think this one shows uh, sort of the the cyclonic storms all over. I mean, you see the swirls. This is really where we first realized um, that Jupiter's a canvas. <laughs> you know, it's so artistic. I don't think we understood or people or, or people really realized, even on the science team, that we were going to be photographing. Uh, things that were so incredibly artistic. So, you know, when this picture was made, we all looked at it in awe. I remember the whole team just going, oh my God, you know, and um, we showed it on a big screen at a team meeting. And immediately when it went out, you know, it's really posted on our public website before we even see it. I mean, that's how we see them. And um, right away, people were, of course, commenting about it's almost like a Van Gogh painting. Mm -hmm. And I had people from all over, uh, from all walks of life, sending me, you know, emails and different messages, some of them taking this picture and putting it in and reformatting it like a Van Gogh painting. And um, it was fascinating to see the immediate connection to art um, and how science and art are, are mixed together. And I have had a passion for that um, uh, throughout my whole life where I've mixed science and art and music together. And um, to have Juno be sort of a, a mechanism to share that concept, it's, uh, it was really, uh, I was really honored about that and very pleased because I believe that, um, that you know, when you mix science and art, you can do more and in particular, you know, missions like Juno or almost anything that we think of when we invent some new idea is really a mixture of analytical thinking and creative thought. And um, so when you see these mixtures right in front of you like that, you really see the imagination and the creative roles mixed with the analytical and logic and mathematics. And that's what, you know, nature really has in store. It's sort of the seed of all Renaissance periods. Um, and uh I like to think that Juno's playing a role in that. Yeah, I think you had a few more pictures. Yeah, uh, I'll show some other ones. This one's one of the more spectacular ones uh, for me because it shows the uh, sort of the magnificence of the swirls. Of course, these pictures are, are, are the colors, uh, the precise colors are selected by the artist that's actually creating the picture. We're not, I'm not governing that. We have filters so a color image can be made, but like most space images, they do their own stretches to try to bring out different details. Um, this is close to their actual colors where the orange hues and the blues are real, but it's probably a little bit exaggerated. But what's incredible are the white uh, parts and you start to see the three dimensions of the cloud structure in Jupiter. And you're gonna see this in other uh, images that I'm gonna show in a bit, where there's these white pop-up clouds that we believe are mostly ammonia. And there, and on some of the images, when you blow them up, you can actually see shadows. So you know those are, are clouds that are elevated above some other cloud base. So much of the colors that you're seeing in these pictures represent different compositions of the clouds, maybe different material that's in them but it also is probably representative of different levels of the cloud dynamics. And of course you're looking at it like a 2D picture, 
but it's really a 3D effect. And when you start to see shadows and other things that are overlaid on top of other ones, uh, you can really start to put the picture together uh, of how the atmospheric dynamics and chemistry are working. And so as beautiful as these pictures are, um, they became tools of science. And, uh, and many of my science team started to play with these and we published things. And we've actually reached out to the amateurs that have actually created the images and included them on some of the publications. In fact, they've customized and reanalyzed things for us. It's just amazing. And so you start to really create citizen scientists. Uh, I like to think of it that we've created, or not created, but gave an opportunity to both citizen scientists and citizen artists. Also one of the most beautiful pictures I, I feel that we've ever taken. And part of it is the, is the fact that it's bluish and you see the blue and white playing off of each other. And you see almost a Paisley-like uh, feature in these swirling cyclone, cyclonic storms and folded filamentary regions of, of the clouds and the wispiness. Um, but you also see the differences in the white and the blues and the darks and the different shades. And all those represent uh, either altitude or composition or a combination of both. And you can really see uh, the beauty that, that uh, is intrinsic to Jupiter here. The different characteristics of, of Jupiter are really, really fascinating. Um, I mean, these pictures are, are such a testament to, you know, the work that you and your team have done and the way you've brought people in to help you with your team. Let's sort of turn, turn the page a little bit and talk about what has Juno discovered since you've been there? Since so uh, we've got a long list of, of discoveries. And uh, let me start off by saying that um, Juno was, I think, a very humbling experience for all of the scientists that were involved because we're all excited when you make a, a, a discovery um, and when your expectations are shown to be you know, wrong or that you need to rethink your theory. But we had so many, so many aspects of Jupiter were different than what we had thought going in that we had to really face the reality that um, we didn't really understand Jupiter until we got there with Juno. And that's despite the fact that we'd had a number of spacecraft that have gone there. We you know, had Pioneer and then Voyager flew by and we learned incredible amounts. And then Galileo actually orbited um, Jupiter and then a couple of spacecraft have looked at it on the way past, like uh, on the way to uh, Saturn or, or um, Pluto. But when Juno went, we got much closer. We went into a polar orbit that gave us this different perspective. Of course, we had different science instruments a little bit and more advanced stuff, but it was mostly the perspective. We got really up close and personal. And when you got up really close, you realize that a lot of the things that you had thought about and real and sort of theorized about from from a distance turned out to be wrong. And um, and one of the first ones was just what did Jupiter's pole look like? And so the the first time we saw it was actually by looking at the infrared picture. And this is an infrared image um, that's uh, that's not exactly over the pole. We have some that are right over, but this gives you the perspective of looking at the pole, and you see these um, these cyclonic storms, these big vortexes that are in a shape of a of a pentagon, and uh, as far as how they're distributed around some big center one, and um, so one pole is like that, and the other pole is very similar, but it has eight instead of five. And um, the only other giant planet, of course, that we had seen the pole of was, was uh, Saturn with Cassini. And it went over the pole and took a picture of it. Um, and it. And it didn't look anything like this. It didn't have giant polar cyclones on it. It had a, an interesting uh, shape of, of a pentagon, but it was mostly you know lines that were uh, shear forces or something associated with the wind dynamics. But here you see giant cyclones. That's so, so somehow Jupiter's familiar zones and belts, the stripes transition uh, by the time you get to both poles into polar cyclones. And so the theories of how these polar cyclones are created, why they end up at the pole and, um, and how they're maintained and how long will they live are all outstanding questions that we don't really know the answer to yet. 
Um, in this picture, uh, because it's infrared, the dark uh, pictures are, are, are the dark colors are cooler and the red uh, is a little bit warmer and the yellow is the warmest. And because Jupiter is warmer down deep than it is at the top, you, this correlates a little bit to elevation. So the, the really yellow parts are probably a little bit deeper and that's why they're hotter. Um, but you see these giant polar cyclones, we discovered this right away when we first got there in 2016 and we've been monitoring them ever since. And, and uh, even though they've made some changes and sometimes it looks like one of these uh, storms are breaking apart or, or separating and a new one's coming in, for a little while we thought there was a new cyclone that was gonna be admitted into the group. Uh, by the time we go in around the next orbit, our orbits are 53 days long. So we, we get a snapshot roughly every month and a half or so. By the time we came around again, the, the newcomer had been kicked out. <laughs> so it's obviously a very exclusive club. And uh, for some reason, they're happy with the membership. Um, I, I know we're, we're running kind of late. Um, we're spending a lot of time, but I, I, um, I wanted to talk a little bit. You've talked about nail biters and hard decisions you had to make. Um, I think there was one conversation um, about the surprising thing that orbital debris we don't think about in terms of Jupiter, but that actually impacted you a little bit, our, or, um, our orbital debris. Uh, well, it didn't impact us, luckily. That's, that's what I was worried about. But it impacted me psychologically. Um, and that was uh, one of the tricks uh, that JPL and NASA use to reach out to the outer planets is they, is they uh, use a gravity assist. It's not just the outer planets, but it's been a trick that the navigation people there figured out that they could fly by the Earth or some other body. And if you get close enough, use that gravity uh, to sling you around, change your direction, add uh, energy to your orbit. And, um, and that's exactly how um, uh, Galileo reached out to, to uh, Jupiter. It's how Cassini got out to Saturn and it's how we got out to Jupiter as well. We had an Earth flyby. So we launched in 2011 and in 2013, October, we were flying by the Earth and um, in order to do this gravity assist. And you have to, and you come pretty close. Uh, you know, 500 kilometers or something like that above the above the Earth's atmosphere. And um, so you're in the range of lots of satellites, right, that the Earth that we have for communications, uh, for surveillance, uh, or just, you know, monitoring the Earth and scientifically as well. Um, and and I was, uh, of course, worried. We're, we're coming up to there. We've got uh, um, people in the military that are helping and, and they're tracking debris that, that is usually leftover spacecraft parts and things like that from a long time ago. And they're watching that and they're feeding it to us and telling us, uh, you know, which, uh, you know, so that we can plot our trajectory and make sure that we avoid the big pieces that people know about. But there's a lot of little pieces that you don't know about and uh, or can't see. And they're pretty dangerous to you because you're moving at a very fast speed. So we're approaching from, from distant space. So we're moving really fast relative to anything that's in orbit at, uh, at Earth. And um, so we were in Denver, uh, the spacecraft was built in Denver at Lockheed Martin. And we were in Denver at that time, uh, all the science team was in a big room and we were kind of watching over stuff. And um, I was nervous just because it's an Earth flyby and, you know, it's a big event and everything's got to go just right. And I, and I have to get the right gravitational sling in order to reach to Jupiter. And we know all that. But just to add to the emotional uh, stress is uh, the movie Gravity was just coming out. And even though I hadn't seen it, I knew what it was about. And I had read, read all the reports. And so I remember reading something about it a day or two before. And of course, the whole thing's about, you know, um, debris hitting uh, these astronauts. And even though that movie wasn't uh, completely accurate scientifically or physically, it was close enough that I, it made me a lot more nervous. <laughs> and, um, and so I was really biting my nails as I was worried about hitting this debris. And, um, and the spacecraft is a very smart robot and has the ability to, if, it, if an emergency happens or anything unexpected, it kind of can take care of itself. And, um, and, and so when we flew by, 
uh, there was a little part because we were moving so fast that it was kind of blind to the communications for a few moments. And um, and when we came out, uh, people told me that we were in this safe mode. Something had gone wrong. And of course, right away, I jumped to the worst conclusion. Oh, my God, something hit us. Some piece of debris hit us. Even a dust particle at that speed would do massive damage. And I was like, oh, my God, what happened? What happened? And, of course, uh, it turned out not to be that because the odds were you weren't going to hit anything. Space is really big, and the space between the debris is incredibly large. That's part of the reason the movie wasn't right. And the odds of us hitting it were pretty slim. But that didn't matter to me. I was scared anyway. And uh, and so is my team. And um, what it turned out is, is we went into safe mode because uh, we did a calculation about where the sun was and how long we'd be in shadow. And we put too many decimals in and, and the computer looked at it and said, oh, the humans were, weren't right. I'm going to throw us into safe mode just in case. And uh, of course, then it just waits for the humans to realize their mistake and correct it. So nothing was really wrong um, other than uh, our own mathematical, you know, <laughs> precision. Incredible. Oh, just incredible. I, I want to, you know, just take this opportunity to thank you personally and your team personally and also on behalf of all of humanity for for your, for being so inspiring. And then not just because you've been able to produce these or the raw data to make these beautiful pictures that would make us really think about other worlds, but because you tackled problems and you solved them. And so in doing that, you and your team have showed us that they, everything is hard but everything can be solved. And that is truly inspiring. And you, you've you put yourself on that foundation of the shoulders of giants. And I look forward to the to the giants who will stand on your shoulders and take us even farther out of the solar system. Um, so thank you again for all of your time. I will let you have the last word uh, if you wanna share a, a particular recollection or have any um, thoughts to share with our audience, which will be people of all ages. And uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. And, and your words are so inspiring. And, and, um, and I believe that it's really important for us to inspire the next generation. So anything I can do, and of course, your, your whole effort to uh, help share the excitement does just that. We want to inspire kids to believe in themselves, to be confident, to uh, try new things. And, uh, and if it doesn't work out, try again, believe in it and mix with friends, mix with people that aren't thinking just like you. I mean, that's part of uh, what enables something like Juno is, is you have the people that are incredibly gifted in mathematics and physics, and you have people that are also uh, creative, and you have people that can do it all as well, but you have all these people from different walks of life with different talents, and maybe they're left brain, maybe they're right brain, you know, whatever, however you like to phrase that, but it's this mixture um, that really makes us all, uh, so productive and what we can accomplish in the future. And um, and so, yeah, I really hope that whatever we're able to do can inspire people to, to think outside the box uh, and uh, and think outside their their little world and, and mix with people that aren't, whether they musicians or artists and scientists, they should all be hanging out together, being great friends. Um, I'll, I'll end with just sort of a quick summary of, of the incredible discoveries that we got that um, that really shook us uh, right down to our core. And, um, and, uh, and no pun intended, because the first one has to do with Jupiter's core. And uh, so we went out and, uh, and our objective was to, to determine whether Jupiter had a small compact core of heavy elements, rocky material in the middle, or was there no core? And the idea was is that the sun maybe doesn't have a core, it just collapsed from a big cloud of material. And uh, the other idea was is that some sort of rocky material like asteroids collected together and then Jupiter got built around it. And if that was true, that would have a core in the middle that we would be able to detect. And when we looked at the gravity field, we found that neither was true. So even though we thought we bound the problem, we actually didn't think imaginatively enough at the beginning, because what turned out was there was a very large core. It's not compact. It's quite diffuse. There's no sharp boundaries. It's almost like what we call a dilute core. And we're still scratching our heads. Scientists all over the world are trying to figure out how do you make a Jupiter like that? Because 
even though and there probably were people that thought about it a little bit before, but not a serious effort was made. And we have no theory of exactly how to make something like that. But there it is. <laughs> and we have to face that reality. Wow. That again, I, I can't think of a better way, more fitting way to end this. I can I have, <laughs> I have a billion more questions, but I, I can't keep you all day. So um, again, thank you, Scott. Really appreciate thank you. it. And, and, and thank congratulations. You for yes. Incredible award that my whole team will share. And we're so honored to be uh, recognized and receive this from you all. So thank you so much. Thank you. This is my uh, transmitter. Maybe it's some, something you can use, I don't know. The High Juno experiment is something that a group of us came up with. The biggest challenge we had was we didn't know if this was going to work or not. If it works, you know, I'm part of history. <laughs> this is W6JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Hello, CQ, CQ, CQ. flyby is Juno's way of gaining some extra speed and changing direction so that its orbit can take it to Jupiter. He said, what if we actually sent something to Juno? I basically came up with the idea that we could send Morse code to Juno, enlist the support of amateur radio operators around the world. So the intent is to join amateur radio community together in a coordinated transmission from Earth to the Juno spacecraft as it flies by. The website would tell them, okay, key down now, then key up, transmit for 30 seconds. And that's how we would send a dit. Everybody knows Morse code is dit, 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 da, da. Well, it turns out to say hi to Juno, it takes four dits and space, and then two dits for the eye. I thought, wow, that's a neat thing to do, and they're gonna need a lot of people to pull this thing off. I said, I'm good to go. We're getting ready right now. Here we go. And now we are transmitting here. They could hear ham radio operators all over the world doing this, which was really remarkable. Everybody's doing this at the same time. Thousands and thousands of hams. With any luck, the Juno spacecraft will be able to listen and hear all these amateur radio transmissions. And so what we're doing now is we're looking at the data that's come down to see if we can put together that signal that says, hi, will it work? Who knows? the audio from Juno. I'd love you to listen to it. This sounds very cool. When you think about what it is, it was really, really amazing. How many times do you get to say hi to a spacecraft that's swinging by your planet? To be a part of it, that was very great. More than thinking about what it means to me, I think it's, it's just such a great thing that humankind has the ability to think beyond our own environment. It's the curiosity, it's the adventuring spirit, I think, that the space program has given us. Hi. Hi Juno. Hi Juno. Hi Juno. Hi Juno. Hi Juno.
All right, Jim. Well, goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> okay, take 17. Jupiter is a very artistic planet. Of all of the planets in our solar system, it has probably the most structure, the most color. So it connects with the artist. But the idea that you can couple our scientific imaging and understanding of the planet with artistic representations of not only what the planet means, but what exploration means has been very valuable to the mission and to the public. One of the coolest things about Juno is that we have a camera on board, it's called JunoCam. It's what we call a, a citizen science camera. JunoCam is on the spacecraft as a means of reaching out to the public. When we defined all of the science objectives. What is the mission Juno going to accomplish? Uh, there was no need for a camera. The reason Juno Cam was added was primarily because I couldn't imagine going all the way to Jupiter and flying over the poles and not seeing what they look like. And I wasn't alone. Every person on my team wanted to see what did it look like? And we figured if we want it, everybody wants it. We all want to know what it looks like. Because JunoCam is not necessary for the science objectives, it freed us up to say, well, how can we engage the public? We only have a certain amount of storage on board the spacecraft for JunoCam images. So that means that when we make a close pass, past Jupiter, we cannot take a picture at every possible opportunity. We have to be choosy, we have to be selective to really decide what we're gonna do on a given pass. We needed to have ground-based pictures of Jupiter to base our plans on. And so that was the first sort of breakthrough was, ah, the amateur astronomy community. We'll bring them on board. One of the best ways of getting continuous observations of Jupiter is to employ citizen scientists and their own small telescopes all around the world. The amateur astronomers are providing us with their pictures that we use for our planning. They upload their pictures onto our website, and then one of our team puts together a cylindrical map so that we can see all of their pictures stitched together we have the public actually identify points of interest and people say, oh, I think this feature is interesting and we should have a picture of it and here's why. And so we can say, okay, of all these hundreds of points of interest, here are the 25 that we will be passing over that are candidates for JunoCam images. So then we, we put it to a vote. What we have then is a prioritized list of targets. Then we develop the actual commands that go to the spacecraft. 
The camera carries out its commands, takes the pictures by voting priority. And then we post the data on our website. That is there for anyone to do whatever kind of processing they would like. They range from actually scientific quality to beautiful works of art. The citizen scientists are people from every walk of life and almost every age group. Children in schools doing it, teachers. You have engineers that work for NASA that don't get to play with the data, but now they do. A whole bunch of the pictures that are being made are equally art as they are science, and people are purposely expressing themselves. I see pictures being made where Jupiter's there, and they've got an astronaut that they've pasted on top. I've seen them where they take a picture of Jupiter and they add it to a photo like you're on a moon of Jupiter. There are people that put Juno into the picture. There's one I love. It's a little angel standing on a perch, and she's looking at Jupiter. And it's just like, oh, that's so cool. That's, I could be standing on that perch. That's kind of how I feel. Another one of my favorites, it's a cup of coffee. And the swirls in the cream are like the swirls in Jupiter's atmosphere. What scientists would think of doing that with our data? And yet it's like, oh yeah, that's me. That's my coffee. <laughs> The camera was put on really to engage the public and allow them to share it with us. It's actually become a very important scientific instrument. And it's providing us the first discoveries of Jupiter's polar dynamics. How does this atmosphere really work? It's the context for our infrared and seeing beneath the clouds. When we started out, we had this concept that we would do science in a fishbowl, explain what we were doing all along the way. And then, we decided, well, why even have a fishbowl? We'll just invite everybody into the fishbowl. Citizen scientists that are making pictures for us are part of our science team. We show the pictures and then there's a team of scientists and some of them are atmospheric experts and they're looking up going, what's that? You know, oh, and, and now they're writing papers about the pictures that citizens of all, from all walks of life have made. In fact, some of them have made so many pictures that are so important we're inviting them into scientific publications because they're, they're part of the team. And uh, it's exciting, and, and I hope that they're getting as much excitement as we are from what they're doing. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome and thanks for joining me. I'm Michelle Hanlon. I'm the president of the National Space Society and the president of For All Moonkind. Um, I'm here to introduce you to the For All Moonkind Moon Registry, a dynamic and free tool designed to share, celebrate, and take universal pride in humanity's greatest technological achievements. Uh, with that, I'll start my slideshow. Thank you. First, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a space lawyer. I'm the co-director of the Center for Air and Space Law at the University of Mississippi School of Law, and I'm the chief editor of the Journal of Space Law, the, one of the only journals in the world dedicated solely to the evolution of space law. At UMIS, our research aligns with NSS as we seek to develop the laws necessary to support sustainable and successful communities in space. I'm also the president of For All Moonkind, which is the only organization in the world committed to protecting human heritage, that's human history in outer space. While we seek to preserve human heritage and history as it collects throughout outer space, we decided to start with the history of our closest neighbor, the history on our closest neighbor, the moon. The narrative of human behavior on the moon starts with a spacecraft called Luna 2. In September 1959, it crash landed on the moon, becoming the first item humans placed on an extraterrestrial ter surface ever. Along with its scientific instruments, Luna 2 carried a stainless steel sphere, like this one, made up of medallions stamped with the name of the Soviet Union and the year. When Luna 2 impacted the moon, 
the sphere was ejected and the medallions were scattered across the lunar surface where they remain undisturbed to this day. Twenty-four Luna missions followed Luna 2 to the moon or its vicinity, including Luna 9, which made the first ever soft landing on the moon, and Luna 17, which landed on the moon in 1970, carrying Lunacod 1, the first successful rover to explore another world, and yes, make the very first extraterrestrial wheel tracks. The remnants of all these missions remain on the moon. Of course, Apollo 11 is the best known moon landing site. Tranquility Base still bears the first boot prints ever placed by a human on a celestial body other than Earth. Boot prints that, so far as we know, remain preserved, undisturbed, pristine, and unravaged by weather or wind. In addition to the things left behind by humans are those things sent by humans. We estimate that there are more than 100 sites on the moon containing human material, including Eugene Shoemaker's ashes, Eugene Shoemaker being one of the founders of the field of planetary science. His ashes were left behind in 1999 by Lunar Prospector. These are the first human or known human remains to be placed off of Earth. All of these sites bear witness to humanity's greatest technological achievements, but it's more than that. As Eugene Cernan said, he thinks probably one of the most significant things we can think about when we think about Apollo is that it has opened for us, for us being the world, a challenge for, of the future. The door is now cracked, but the promise of the future lies in the young people, not just in America, but the young people all over the world learning to live and learning to work together. In other words, embracing space means embracing the universality of our human experience, and in so doing, working together for and in peace rather than in war. It is the goal of For All Moonkind to foster this international cooperation. Indeed, at the core of For All Moonkind's philosophy is the recognition that global and off-world issues are best solved through international collaboration. Many believe that this collaboration and cooperation will be difficult to achieve in today's political climate. We do not. We only need look to history to find the one area in which the nations of the world find themselves in continuous agreement and that is with respect to the protection of cultural heritage. In 1959, Egypt proposed the construction of a dam that would flood ancient temples of Nubia, known as one of the cradles of human civilization. It was recognized even then that it is not easy to choose between heritage and the well-being of people, but tre treasures of unrivaled value are entitled to universal protection and preservation will not just preserve something which may otherwise be lost, but will in addition bring to light to as yet undiscovered wealth for the benefit of all. In this case, the international community rallied. 80 million US dollars was raised from 47 nations and a number of private entities. International experts from five continents convened to save 23 temples and sites, some of them relocated brick by brick. In short, humanity came together to save treasures it was recognized belong not just to Egypt, but to humanity as a whole. In the words of UNESCO Director General, the International Rescue Nubia campaign will be numbered among the few major attempts made in our lifetime by the nations to assume their common responsibility towards the past so as to move forward in a spirit of kinship towards the future. The World Heritage Convention grew out of this effort and today is one of the world's most ratified treaties. That means nearly every nation on earth agrees that deterioration or disappearance of any item of the cultural or natural heritage constitutes a harmful impoverishment of the heritage of all the nations of the world, and that collective effort must be undertaken to protect cultural heritage, heritage of outstanding universal value. And what's equally important to note is that protecting heritage doesn't mean preventing or stopping or hindering development. It means working together to preserve in any way we can these important milestones of our human, uh, human society. Unfortunately, the World Heritage Convention cannot be applied to outer space. The convention relies upon states to nominate heritage sites within their territories. And of course, it is one of the precepts of international space law that space states may not claim territory in outer space by sovereignty or any other means. Thus, we can borrow from the 
World Heritage Convention, but cannot follow its nominating scheme. This is why For All Mankind advocates for the cooperation in respect of, and ultimately the negotiation of a treaty addressing the identification, recognition, and protection of human heritage in outer space. We are heartened that Australia, Canada, Italy, Japan, Luxembourg, UAE, the UK, the Ukraine, and now South Korea, through Section 9 of the Artemis Accords, have also formally recognized the importance of preserving heritage in space. Of course, we are also working at the national level. In the United States, we were instrumental in the drafting and enactment of, and enactment of the One Small Step to Protect Human Heritage in Space Act, which is the very first national legislation to recognize that there are sites of universal human value in space. In 2018, we embarked on an ambitious project to create a registry of all of the human-made items on the moon. From Luna to Apollo to Chang'e and everything in between, the moon registry provides overviews of every mission that has impacted the moon, including details on the objects related to those missions that remain on the lunar surface from commemorative medallions and flags to rovers and scientific experiments. Initially, this moon registry was intended to serve as a resource for archeologists, scientists, engineers, and other professionals. Then we realized that this history belongs to all humanity. So we made this moon registry available to everyone for free. We also realized that human history in space is being created every day. So we made this moon registry dynamic Finally, we realized that countless individuals made contributions to this history that may not have yet been recorded. So we added crowdsourcing capability and encourage you to add your story. Our history is precious. That is why this moon registry will ultimately be preserved using blockchain technology to protect the integrity of the data and the data gathering process. The site needed to raise awareness. And as such, it was designed by critically acclaimed creative director, Bernie Hoje. Mr. Hoje is responsible for a number of award-winning images and advertising campaigns. His most famous and most effective campaign was the United States focused Got Milk campaign, which proved to be so iconic, it is featured in the United States National Museum of American History. The For All Mankind Moon Registry has been welcomed by, among others, two moonwalkers and historian and author James Hansen, Neil Armstrong's official biographer. Harrison Schmidt said, an interactive registry for all the material on the moon introduced by human activity is a worthy cause without a doubt. Charlie Duke added that the For All Mankind Moon Registry is a spectacular resource. It's one small way to share this accomplishment of humanity with humanity. And James Hansen stated, that the For All Mankind Moon Registry is like an all access pass to the history of human activity on the moon. Even better, he continued, the crowdsourcing function will allow the people who worked on missions like Luna and Apollo to connect directly with the very students who will be inspired by their work. A dy dynamic work in progress, the For All Mankind Moon Registry displays facts about past lunar missions and seeks crowdsourcing assistance to correct any mistakes contribute technical details, share personal stories, and provide information regarding future missions. Currently, the information we are recording with respect to each site includes mission details, mission type, the operator, the launching state, the location, including latitude and longitude, the launch date, the landing date, and a list of objects on or related to the site. We will continue to add additional information to the structure as necessary. Of course, there are still many gaps and probably a lot of mistakes too. And we invite everyone to contribute their knowledge and experience through the website contact page. We also look forward to collecting information about future missions. Thus, the For All Mankind Moon Registry fulfills three functions to promote sustainable and successful exploration of space and ultimately human communities in space. First, in its outreach and awareness raising capacity, it makes the details of the amazing history of human exploration of the moon accessible to all for free. Second, in its information sharing capacity, it provides important data regarding the location and heritage considerations for historic missions and allows for the opportunity to share such data regarding future missions. And finally, we hope it will inspire, enhance, and support international cooperation and collaboration. 
We hope you visit our registry and we very much look forward to your comments and contributions. Thank you. sorry for all the things we've done to you. We didn't mean to hurt you, but our needs got the best of us. Now we know there's a better way, one that will give us everything we need without harming you ever again. It's all about electricity. Space solar power. The sun provides clean and virtually limitless power 24 hours a day. Space solar power is clean, abundant, and the costs of collecting and transmitting it back to you, dear Earth, are negligible. And space solar power is virtually emissions-free and kind to you. Space solar power will help us to repair the climate and make you healthier than ever. To learn more and donate, go to go.nss.org ssp. We will become a spacefaring species, and I don't just mean trips to the moon or sending robots to the asteroid belt. I mean actual civilizations on other planets and large asteroids, and perhaps even beyond our own solar system. We're explorers by nature and we're inventors by nature, and we will devise better technologies, and we will come up with methods that will allow us to live permanently in space. We should be able to make areas of space that are habitable. Space should become a destination and a place that is part of various industries that exist today on Earth. Going to space is satisfying a, a curiosity that fundamentally is just in our DNA. And I think of all the reasons, that's probably the best. We could actually achieve space colonization. We could actually achieve cities on the moon. 
space travel between planets. It could be there, given the opportunity. It's a mandate that we find a way to become an interplanetary species. I see that as the, the most important thing that we have to accomplish in space. It's in our nature to go further. We want to escape the confines of our planet and experience the wonders of the solar system. If by mid-century we are all out there in space and we have opened up the paradigm, and we have changed the mindset that so many of us have here in this trapped cradle. If we can open that up and move out and by mid-century have access to balanced resources, power and energy, and the space flight we need. Hi, it's it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Haim Benaroya. I'm on the faculty of the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Rutgers University in New Jersey. And I'll be giving a talk on lunar habitats. It's a short talk, but I wanna to try to give you an overview of how concepts were initi initiated and how they've evolved uh, with a particular example. So it's my pleasure to, to begin. So engineering lunar settlements, people have been interested in uh, settling the moon for a long time. Obviously science fiction started a long time ago before the engineers, uh, but now the engineers are trying to catch up. And uh, over the past 70 years, engineers have been designing uh, habitats in anticipation of humans returning to the moon. And it looks like that in this decade, uh, that will happen. So this image here that you see is from Project Horizon, which was actually a 1950s US Army project uh, anticipating the return to the moon and the uh, importance of having Americans on the moon uh, from the Army's point of view for national defense. And what you can see in this image uh, is really that even in the 1950s, uh, we understood some of the key issues that uh, we had to deal with as engineers. We see these uh, circular tubes that are being buried and uh, will be eventually pressurized. Uh, we see the fact that it was understood that uh, the radiation environment, the micrometeorite environment, uh, were issues that had to be resolved by engineers. Uh, now, the, the concept there is not very different from the kinds of uh, habitats that will be landing on the moon, which will be pressure vessels. Here you see from the 60s, during the Apollo period, um, one of those pressure vessels, uh, concepts where uh, a, a rover is, be, is being uh, landed, and uh, we see that uh, they're going to be putting regolith on top of this structure. Uh, so this idea um, probably won't be that different from what we do in this decade of basically uh, placing habitats on the lunar surface, uh, pressurizing them so that astronauts can live inside without their spacesuits, uh, and shielding them from the very hostile environment on the lunar surface. Here is a, another concept using an igloo-based design that I and some of my students considered over the past 15 years. So the igloo is a really attractive concept from the point of view of it being modular. You see the igloo in various configurations. Uh, what you can't see here is that it will be covered in regolith because of the environment, uh, obviously a door and those kind of things. But this igloo is modular, allowing expansion, which is one of the criteria that we have for lunar habitats. Just briefly to remind you of the, of the environment that we deal with, the, the moon has a one-sixth Earth, Earth gravitational acceleration. We want to internally pressurize the habitats anywhere from uh, 10 to 15 pounds per square inch. We want to protect the interior from radiation and micrometeoroids. We want to insulate from the very large temperature differentials, about 250 degree temperature from daytime to nighttime. Uh, we think that two to three meters of regolith on top of the structure will shield against almost all of this. One of the things that we discovered in Apollo that we didn't know before was, it, was that the regolith is toxic and it's also very dangerous for machinery. So people who assume that we're gonna use robots on the lunar surface to build things, which we eventually have to do, 
have to understand that those robots have to be uh, designed to deal with that regolith that gets into all the mechanisms that can short circuit the electronics. So that's a real issue. And the final one is lunar seismicity. We don't think of the moon as, as being very seismically active and it isn't. However, it does have seismic activity. Again, we found that during Apollo, the extent of that. And whereas the habitats might not be uh, subject to seismic uh, problems, uh, some of the more flexible structures like antennas and very flexible solar panels might be might need to be designed for those kinds of seismic events. The other thing that engineers may not have to deal with but have to be aware of is that the low microgravity environment uh, causes a lot of issues. We, we know about that from the space station. For example, there's a cardiovascular deconditioning, bodily fluids shift to the upper body, uh, the vestibular sense uh, is, is distorted, our sense of balance. We lose blood volume, uh, cataracts develop, muscle atrophies, cancer can potentially develop. The bone demil demineralizes at 1.5% per month. And then there are pharmacological issues. For example, medicines that we take on Earth assume that we have full circulation under Earth gravity. But on the moon, at 1 6th gravity, our blood isn't going to circulate the same way. So whereas I'm not really talking about that from that lunar habitat perspective, engineers who design lunar habitats will have to deal with some of these issues that they can build into their designs. And then there are psychological issues. For example, the, the crew is isolated, they're confined, which leads to lower cognitive brain function, depression, compulsive behavior. The workload is very heavy. Uh, they're almost working all the time when they're not sleeping. And then they have enforced togetherness in these very small habitats. It leads to introversion, impairs the immune system. So we have physiological and psychological issues in addition to the engineering issues. And they all work together, they're all coupled. So engineering designers will have to be able to design these structures, fully anticipating all these other issues that are not engineering. So looking at more advanced structures, we anticipate much larger structures like the inflatable ones, whereas the initial ones, as I showed you, are pressure vessels. Later on, they become inflatable structures. Here you see a cutaway of a, of a famous image uh, of a structure with uh, many levels uh, for different purposes. And um, the idea with the inflatable structure is you, you can package it into a small volume, bring it to the lunar surface, deploy it, make it rigid, cover it with regolith, and then have a large volume within which to work. Here's a, a schematic of the interior of that same structure. So you can see there are four levels. Uh, each level has its own function. There's, you see the airlock on the right. Uh, and uh, so the inflatable structure is one part of the structure, but then inside that large volume, one has to build a, a framework, essentially a, a building within that inflatable structure, partitioning the floors and partitioning each, uh, each space to, to its function. So, yeah, so here, here's an example of a hemispherical and cylindrical inflatable structures that NASA conceives. Uh, perhaps you can see in the center left where that dome is, you can see uh, a tractor putting regolith on top, placing bags around the loops. You can see that on both, both of these structures. That's, those are basically bags full of regolith, uh, and they're meant, again, to shield against the radiation, micrometeorites, uh, the extreme thermal environment. And the inter interior of these structures are pressurized so astronauts uh, can just walk around inside without uh, using their spacesuits. So this last segment here uh, is a, a structure that, that we conceived of in the last several years. Uh, so we call it the inflatable deployable lunar base. So this is how it looks when it's finally deployed. It basically has a, a flexible framework. And what you'll see on, on, the, on the next slide is uh, how it starts off. So, so here is the, the structure when it's uh, folded together. Think of it like an umbrella. It's, it's closed now, uh, and it's going to be placed in a rocket, and the, the size of our design fits into SpaceX's larger, largest rocket conceived to date. It can fit in there, and then it will be uh, brought to orbit around the moon, landed, and then it would deploy, almost like think of it like opening up the umbrella. 
So here it is. Um, this is an animation. Uh, so this is in what you see is in its compact mode, and then the animation uh, shows you how how it opens up, and once it opens up, uh, that framework will will basically uh, pop open. Okay, and in this animation, you have all the base plates open, and the framework uh, is still not fully deployed. So that that framework will then open up into a, a hemisphere configuration within which uh, the uh, inflatable membrane would be um, would be placed. So that membrane is stored in the column, uh, the column that you see there in the center, and that membrane would come out and then would be internally pressurized. So here it is with the, uh, the framework totally uh, deployed. And then the next slide will show you the membrane. This is a cutaway showing the interior and showing how the membrane has been deployed uh, inside that framework. So once it's pressurized, you have this very large volume. Uh, this is about 17 meters in diameter. So it's a very large volume within which you can partition the interior for various functions. Oops, there it is. So this is now showing you uh, the, complete, uh, uh, the complete framework. In this model here, we looked at two different cases. We looked at the case where the framework is on the outside and the framework is on the inside. This one just shows you with the framework on the inside. You can see the column, uh, how it looks, and it's uh, interior to that uh, structure. Again, this is a very large volume, and that's really the benefit of the inflatable structure concept. The idea is that eventually we will have inflatable structures uh, that are very large, uh, allowing uh, a lot of things to happen inside uh, for ver various applications. Uh, and uh, the advantage of them is that uh, people have a much um, uh, a, a much more um, psychologically pleasing environment within which to work. Large volumes, rather the, the circular cylindrical pressure pressure vessel types, is basically like living in a in a hallway. Uh, you, know, it, you may have a lot of space if you put a lot of these cylinders together, but you don't have an open expanse. So you, uh, humans like to have this open expanse so they can see long distances. Otherwise, they feel very constrained. So just in summary, uh, we looked at different kinds of structures. Uh, this historical record shows that these pressure vessels have been uh, favored for quite a while for a good reason. Uh, you can easily put them in a rocket. You can land them on the moon, you can pressurize them, and you know, voila, you have a, a lunar habitat. Uh, they are limited, um, and so we see perhaps hybrid, like the one I just showed you, the rigid deployable structures, uh, eventually de fully deployable structures that one can rigidize and then build within, uh, and eventually uh, using in situ resource utilization, basically using the regolith, processing it, creating building materials from that, uh, ideally, uh, having robots build these structures. It's uh, unrealistic to expect astronauts to become construction workers because of the environment. Uh, and in order for, to, to fully develop uh, human habitation on the lunar surface, one really needs uh, some semi-automated process by which these structures will be built. Uh, 3D printed and layered manufacturing uh, is one, one approach that we can see uh, in the not too distant future. Once we're on the surface of the moon and we have an infrastructure, we have enough power to do all these things. Uh, I think we can see uh, the lunar lunar civilization, lunar uh, cities develop uh, quite rapidly uh, after that point. So a shameless plug, these are two books of mine. Uh, the one on the left is a, a future history written as though uh, it was 2169 about a, a possible path through time uh, as to how we uh, evolved into a spacefaring civilization. The one on the right is a more uh, engineering or approach, but it talks about all the issues related to building habitats and uh, having humans be safe on the moon in case you're interested in a lot more details that I could not present here. Hello, this is Madhu Thangavelu from the University of Southern California. And uh, uh, I would like to talk to you about um, uh, lunar tourism. Uh, in this moon track, you've heard some creative ideas about architectures and education, engineering and simulations underway. 
And you have even heard about the law and some international issues relating to it. Now let me share some thoughts about using all that we have, all that we know about humans, human spaceflight, to take ordinary citizens on a tour of our dear moon. Um, NSS has a long affiliation with the moon. NSS wants people living and working in outer space. Um, the moon book is in the NSS library. The new spare spirit times, the new, the new uh, visions for, for space uh, include Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, John Marburger, uh, Joseph Campbell, Freeman Dyson, uh, Frank White, and our own president, Michelle Handlin, has some ideas about what, what we should do uh, with, um, with space artifacts. And um, Buzz Aldrin um, is a champion of our studio, and here you see him autographing our moon book. Uh, Neil Armstrong was attending USC when he was assigned to command uh, Apollo 11 mission. Buzz Aldrin, as I mentioned, is a champion of our studio, and you may want to visit our site, our USC site, and there are some several lunar ideas coming up next. Um, Neil Armstrong um, was uh, in, uh, at USC uh, when he was assigned the uh, mission, and here you see his uh, thesis that was presented at the Johnson Space Center um, after he completed his work at USC. Uh, USC has a um, astronautical engineering program, which is very different in its curriculum than uh, the aerospace engineering program. And here you see uh, the number of students uh, who, who have been awarded degrees and we operate around the globe. Um, here you see our studio during final review. It's one of those rare classes where uh, the reviewers outnumber our students. Low Earth orbit, LEO, is where the action begins for lunar tourism. Um, the concept for, um, for assembling structures in low Earth orbit have been around for a long time. The International Space Station was assembled in a modular fashion. And we think we can do the lunar base as well in a modular fashion. And that would be the beginning of, of lunar tourism activities. Here you see my thesis, um, which talked about lunar tourism, um, about um, building a lunar base in, in Earth orbit using the space station. Um, uh, for, for the purposes of lunar tourism, we would engage space stations in low Earth orbit where, where our tours would spend a little time acclimatizing to the space environment. Um, as you know, um, many of our astronauts suffer what's called the space adaptation syndrome. And uh, um, we call it a puffy eyes, chicken leg syndrome. And uh, 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 it is important that our, our, our passengers and our tours uh, become acclimatized before we fly off to the moon. Um, there may be very many different kinds of stations in orbit. And uh, here you see another space station um, that also has um, accommodations for uh, tours in transit. Two and a half days is what it takes um, for, um, for uh, traveling from the Earth to the Moon using conventional propulsion systems. And uh, it's no different than uh, how uh, Apollo or Apollo mission um, conducted their, um, their schedule. And um, uh, now private space companies are also eyeing very similar trajectories to take ordinary uh, tours, ordinary citizens uh, to the moon and back. 
uh, our own students have been working on several ideas and here you see what a um, you know, what a stack would look like as it departs for uh, for the moon with perhaps uh, 10 or 12 um, passengers on board uh, you see a departure of the stack uh, towards the moon and the most important part <laughs> the most important part of um, of this um, you know, habitat transfer habitat is probably the storm shelter because as you will see in the next image the sun can play havoc uh, um, to our our wonderful tours um, and so we need to protect them from the harmful radiation of the sun and hence a solar storm shelter into which you'll have to cramp yourself in uh, for for a few hours at most now it's all about the view um, that is what we expect to do in the first few um, the first few years of lunar tours looking out from the international space station we get some sense of planet earth but not the way you would from further out as we move out we start to see uh, the planet uh, as a whole uh, here you see uh, you can see the um, the entire um, uh, entire synoptic view of the Earth as we move out from uh, from Earth orbit. And as you know, the Earth will appear very large from the Moon because uh, if you look at the sizes, uh, the Moon is very small compared to planet Earth. And so if you were looking at the Moon from Earth, um, and if you're looking at the Earth from the Moon, uh, it would appear much, much bigger. And as you get close to the moon, uh, you'll start to appreciate the um, topography of the moon, the relief of the moon, and the various visuals, uh, which are quite spectacular. These are some of the images um, that we have um, acquired from uh, the um, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And uh, this is the uh, million dollar view that people want to appreciate while they swing around the moon and head back to Earth. And of course, um, you, you return safely back after a very fiery uh, entry, much, much more energetic than the Earth. But now let us look at the future. The, the future holds tremendous promise for people looking towards tourism on the moon. We think that um, we will be able to uh, offer uh, simulated gravity so that people don't have to um, suffer uh, puffy, puffy eyes and chicken leg syndrome and can really be, be uh, comfortably traveling towards the moon. They would arrive at a lunar orbiting station, uh, which would have the finest uh, hospitality uh, available to them, and uh, uh, they would orbit the moon. And in the future, we expect them to land on the moon, uh, tours, ordinary tours. And uh, then uh, we could uh, go to what I think, uh, one of some of our students think, that uh, um, a, a, a museum of sorts would be located on the moon where the first uh, humans uh, stepped on the moon and uh, you probably would do some very interesting things like uh, uh, roving around on the surface of the moon or um, going on a bus ride uh, further out to see what uh, the explorers and the scientists are doing and uh, you would get to see uh, a holographic image of the first uh, first uh, humans stepping on exactly the same spot that that uh, and that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin uh, took their first steps. We would, would uh, hopefully continue to see um, vegetation on the moon with uh, uh, agriculture and hydroponic and aeroponic uh, um, facilities, 
And uh, you may also go down into some lava tubes where they may have a, um, a permanent uh, settlements. Robotic construction will um, allow us to build structures on the surface and below the moon, uh, below the surface of the moon. Robots will help us, um, and uh, we can see um, we can see astronauts um, uh, building up infrastructure and also um, communicating uh, with uh, robots uh, to get uh, work done. Uh, my own favorite uh, uh, um, experience would be uh, to take a train ride on the moon from pole to pole. Um, uh, it might just take you a couple of hours. And uh, here you see a depiction uh, that shows a, a electromagnetic uh, um, levitated uh, train. And they would grow in time for tourists who would like to visit the moon uh, more than once, more often. So you, so just like Hawaii, would have uh, tours from on the moon. And um, it is, um, it is. Uh, some people think that the moon, because it is a continent, that that everybody on planet Earth can see, could host even um, a United Nations. Uh, facility of some sort, with the centerpiece being a, a nexus for, um, for, uh, for preserving uh, humanity's archives. So that uh, the, uh, much of the archives would be uh, underground, it'd be buried underground uh, to keep it safe from meteorites and so on, and you'd be able to update it over a period of time. And all this and all these activities bring to mind um, uh, the studies and thoughts of Buckminster Fuller, um, who reminds us in his works that spaceship Earth uh, is really a spacecraft of sorts in which we are all astronauts. So it is with that kind of thinking that we look forward to lunar tours uh, to excite people, but also to bring home the point that all these things we do to extend our horizons is not only to have excitement for the purpose of excitement, but to remind us that um, we are a species that, that need to take care of planet Earth. So in summary, space tourism is a commercial uh, human space activity. Um, it is about utilization and not about exploration as much. And it evolves from the suborbital to the orbital to the lunar and beyond. All comers rests on a fundamental principle of sustainability. Sustainability in commerce means having a profit motive because without a profit, you cannot run a business. So profit is equal to revenue minus cost. NASA is helping to create a commercial space activity because uh, we know that ISS will soon host the first um, uh, NASA's um, uh, space tourist uh, as a as a um, as a mandate uh, to uh, to have space tours, and it will be followed by private space stations, and lunar tourism will follow that. And um, once we have lunar orbital tourism we can expect to see lunar surface tourism as well in the coming years. Now, Apollo did uh, take people out there 50 years ago. And a few astronauts have been there. And now, uh, when you look back, we notice that perhaps a million people were involved in getting Apollo together. Now. Very few people are involved, very few private entrepreneurs are involved. And we'll be spending, we'll be sending millions of people to the moon and beyond. Uh, this is part of NHS goal. And many of these ideas are in our book. And it is the book that I use for my class. And um, um, so that is about uh, our lunar tourism.
dear distinguished delegates of 2021 edition of international space development conference greetings from india and the indian space research organization it is my pleasure to address you all today and i thank the national space society for giving me this opportunity the theme of this event continuing the journey has significance both in general for humanity and in particular to the space community the prevailing pandemic situation has pushed all of us to this very challenging and trying time our personal and professional lives have been affected by this pandemic but we need to continue the journey by adhering to the new normals the pandemic appropriate behavior and ensure safety of all our near and dear ones in the context of space the theme continuing the journey is fully relevant as we are going through testing times on one hand space technology is advancing at a rapid pace allowing us to confidently talk about possible human settlements on the moon the mars and elsewhere in the galaxy on the other hand we are witnessing our immediate outer space becoming increasingly congested and contested here only the concept of long term sustainability of the outer space activities is pertinent for us to continue the space journey i would like to take this opportunity to talk about india space journey and our efforts in continuing the same the beginning of the journey of india's space program was very humble india's program started way back in the early 1960s with the formation of indian national committee on space research incospar as we call it incospar was spearheaded by the visionary dr vikram sarabhai and he laid the foundation to set up the thumba equatorial rocket launching station we call it thels in the southernmost part of india god's own country called at tiruvananthapuram especially due to its proximity to the earth's magnetic equator the thels was dedicated to the united nations for studies of the equatorial atmosphere at thels the rocket and payload design integration and testing activities etc were carried out from a church building and the bishop's house donated by the local fishing community in the mid 60s many sounding rockets were launched successfully from thels to probe and study the earth atmosphere through international cooperation with the participation of the major space players of that time such as usa the erstwhile ussr france and germany from that very humble beginning isro grew to the current level of possessing an end to end indigenous cap- capability to design develop and launch satellites to different orbits for earth observation satellite communication satellite navigation space science and planetary exploration but isro's thrust has always been harnessing the benefits of space technology for the betterment of humanity isro has well laid plans for continuing its journey in space science research from the early beginnings using the sounding rockets and high altitude balloons to study the earth atmosphere to the current level of developing advanced instruments to explore the planets chandrayaan 1 was the first in the series of dedicated science missions undertaken by isro in 2008 which carried a suite of 11 payloads including six payloads from other nations including the usa the chandrayaan 1 mission led to several discoveries including reconfirmation 
presence of water molecules on the surface of the moon. ISRO's Mars orbital mission was India's first interplanetary mission to Mars. India could achieve to reach the Martian orbit in her very first it attempt itself and became the first country to do it so. The mission reached Mars in 2014 and it is still operational in the Martian orbit well beyond the planned operation life of one year. The five payloads mounted on board the Mars orbital mission are conducting scientific observations on Mars surface features, morphology, mineralogy and the Martian atmosphere. The highly elliptical orbit of Mars orbiter helped the Mars color camera to take the full Martian disk as well as the far side of Deimos, the one of the moon of Mars for the first time and continues to provide classic images of the Martian topography. Astrosat, India's first multi wavelength observatory in space launched in 2015 has successfully completed 5 years in orbit and continues to provide excellent data of hot stars, evolved stars, planetary nebulae, star clusters, star forming galaxies cluster of galaxies etcetera in the distant universe. Astrosat observations have led to many discoveries and unique observations in space such as discovery of UV photons from epoch of reionization and observation of Crab Nebula Pulsar and Black Hole Cygnus X1 to name a few. The observation time in Astrosat is being allotted to the interested national and international researchers based on the proposals received in response to the periodic announcement of opportunity. I am proud to inform you that nearly 50 percent of Astrosat time is being used by international teams with more than 1500 users worldwide. India's second lunar mission Chandrayaan 2 with orbiter lander configuration was launched in 2019. Though the lander could not soft land on the moon's surface as planned, the orbiter is still operating in the moon orbit successfully and is providing high resolution images of the moon. I would like to stress here that the data from all these missions are made available to the international space science community through a dedicated Indian space science data center. Anyone who is interested in this data can register and get the data. The data is being widely used by researchers globally and their research findings are published in more than 100 publications of high impact journals. Considering the achievements generated by our space science and planetary missions, we are planning to have missions for improving our understanding of the universe, the space weather, exploration of the moon and other planetary bodies. The next lunar lander mission Chandrayaan 3 is getting ready and will be launched next year. It will conduct in situ science experiments on the lunar surface. ISRO is also working with Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency JAXA for a joint lunar polar exploration mission with the lander and rover. This mission will be a new technology demonstrator with payloads for the in situ exploration of the moon. Over the next year, we hope to land, launch our dedicated first space based solar mission Aditya L1 with a focus to study the inner solar corona. Aditya L1 would be placed in a halo orbit around the sun earth Lagrangian point 1 L1 to study the various processes on corona, chromosphere and the photosphere. This challenging mission carries a coronagraph, a UV imager, a soft and hard x-ray spectrometers and instruments to study particles and fields. The next small but important mission to study X-ray polarization in astrophysical sources Exposat is also in the building stages. This will be the first of a new series of X-ray polarity polar emissions worldwide and will be supplemented with a low energy spectrometer for continuous spectro polarimetric monitoring of sources. Exposat will study the 50 brightest known sources in the universe including pulsars. 
black hole X-ray binaries, active galactic nuclei and non-thermal supernova remnants. We are also working on various other exploration missions in the inner solar system including follow on orbital mission to Mars and an exciting new mission to explore Venus. We also have invited international payloads for our Venus mission with an open announcement of opportunity and the response has been extremely good. In addition to these robotic exploration missions, India has embarked on the human space flight program. A dedicated human space flight center has been established for coordinating the activities towards this. The initial program named as Gaganyan will consi consist of two unmanned missions followed by a crewed mission. For achieving the objectives, we need to develop a number of key technologies such as human rating of the launch vehicle, environment and control and life support systems, astronaut training, space food and medicines, etc. We are cooperating with the established players in these areas. The astronaut candidates have been identified and they have completed their initial leg of training in Russia. The Gaganyan specific training will be conducted in India. Along with these programs, the governance architecture of the Indian space program is undergoing a transition addressing the need of the time. The progress made in space technology and applications elsewhere and especially in India has prompted the Indian private entities to venture into space. The government of India also acknowledged this by announcing the reforms in the space sector with an intention to make the Indian private entities to be a part of India's space journey. A dedicated mechanism, the Indian National Space Promotion and Authorization Center in space has been created by the Government of India to handhold, promote and authorize the private entities space activities. With this announcement, we have seen a great increase in interest among the space entrepreneurs and a few promising initiatives have come up. We expect increased private investment in all aspects of space, be it building a launch vehicle and providing launch services building and launching satellites, owning satellites and operating them and providing space-based services. The initial response received from the industry also shows that they are excited about this. To aid this process, India is in the process of enacting the Space Activities Bill and developing the policy framework for the conduct of the space activities by the private entities. I am sure that with the strong political will from the government and substantiated with the proposed legal and policy frameworks, the Indian space program will see rapid developments in the coming days. Now coming back to the team, ISRO has also taken measures to continue the journey which has been affected by the global pandemic. Though it has forced us to miss schedules of many of our missions we worked to reduce the impact through project prioritization and remote working. Wherever possible, we got into teleworking mode by equipping ourselves with the tools like in-house video conferencing systems and instant messaging systems. With these measures, we could resume launch campaign at our launch port. It called for working out detailed protocols for the travel, stay and work at the launch port not only for ISRO officials, but also for the officials of customer satellites from other nations. We resorted to remote monitoring of integration activities and shared all the real-time data across ISRO centers through intranet so that officials can work from their respective center and avoid traveling. All these actions and planning helped us to successfully launch the PSLV C-51, the Amazonia 1 mission on 28 February this year. Many of these efforts are going to continue and will become the new norm for ISRO's launch campaign activities in the future. In conclusion, I would like to stress that India has well laid plans for continuing her space journey with both technological advancement and participation of private entities. I once again thank the organizers 
the National Space Society for giving me this wonderful opportunity. I wish you all healthy and safe days ahead. Thank you all and Jai Hind. Friends, very good evening from India. I am Avinash Shirode, President, NSS Nashik India Chapter, as well as a Space Ambassador and also a member of Board of Directors of NSS. Uh, I am here to make a presentation about the World Space Week program, which was conducted in Nashik, India, uh, for last three years. We have been doing this program since last many years as a our fla flagship program. And it is for the full week from 4th October to 10th October. So what is uh, World Space Week? The United Nations General Assembly declared 4th to 10th of October as World Space Week to celebrate each year at the international level for the contributions of the space science and technology to the betterment of the human condition. Every year they have a different theme. This year, last year, the theme was, 2020 theme was, Satellites improve life. What, are, what is the importance of these two dates? 4th October 1957, it was the launch of the first human made Earth satellite Sputnik 1, thus opening the way for space exploration. And 10th October 1967, the signing of the Treaty on Principles governing the activities of states in the exploration and peaceful uses of the outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies. And this is the whole week program. It was a jam-packed program uh, for all the seven days from 4th to 10th of October. Uh, in the morning, we had uh, a big rally in the city of Nashik for and where 1,000 students had participated with uh, placards of uh, different uh, space scientists and events and like that. And the rally was going through the major roads on the uh, city of Nashik. And on this occasion, I had given uh, a specially designed T-shirt to all the 1,000 students and also to the very eminent people from the city of Nashik who had participated in our rally. Then for, for uh, some presentations we had from USA also and also from other people who could not attend personally. So they made a presentation uh, online. So we have all those things. I'm very happy to tell you that Joseph Bland, who was the uh, president of uh, NSS chapter assembly, he had arranged a special meeting of all the chapter presidents and uh, leaders on this occasion. And it was a great chance and opportunity for the students to have interaction with the various space leaders uh, uh, from the uh, NSA chapters. And then at the end of the week, as the last program, we had a prize distribution ceremony. Actually, for uh, before this uh, program, we had uh, announced for the essay competition, uh, project competition, model models competition uh, for all the students. And at the end, we had a prize distribution for all the prize winners. So this is the whole program of a week. Then this is how every day the programs were there. On the first day, we had a presentation by the chairman of Indian Space Research Organization, Mr. Kiran Kumar. And uh, his presentation got such a big atten attention 
that uh, the students, the hall was jam-packed and the students had to sit on the dais itself in front of the speaker. And this is the uh, scene of uh, the audience. Then we had, uh, along with that, we also had uh, presentations online by other speakers. Then this was the uh, uh, meeting, NSS uh, chapter meeting uh, held by uh, Joseph Bland. And this small girl, she is asking questions to the uh, speakers and participants. And this is how this uh, program was held. Then every day we had program. These are the speakers. Then these are the audience at a different, then uh, this different space. We had uh, uh, Bruce McKenzie also making a presentation on living on Mars. Then we had also a spiritual lecture, spiritual lecture describing uh, space and spirituality uh, interaction. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. I'm so happy and again thank uh, NSS for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. debate opportunity has taken that bold step of bringing it into the domain of young adults. If what we've done is, is created that energy and that interest. When you see these students speaking about it and using the terms that we use as if it was always their term, I don't think there's anything more rewarding quite honestly. Universalization is the act of all the nations on Earth, all the people coming together to tackle problems that affect us all. The universalization, in my point of view, will change the world to a better place and a whole new league of problem solving together. Figuring out a plan for universalization space is something that's really important and is really impacting us right now. We want every individual involved in every matter because we're humans and this is our world. We need to rule it together. We want um, all countries to be able to to have that international collaboration. It's going to bring us all together for a common cause. Find a way to agree on the new laws in space that that are helpful and that everyone can cooperate and agree on. I think it starts now, and we begin that conversation. And as we plan, we are making way for generations to come to go to space in peace and borderless to boot. You don't see that borders, you don't see that differences. Just like we have seen in the debate now, the students from different countries are actually part of a team. The opportunity to put it in the hands of our next generation of leaders is what we need to do because they are the ones who are going to help us really resolve because it's their world. They need to own this. Do you guys all want to live in space? Yeah, yeah sure. sure. It's my dream, actually. It's like a magic. So we can discover all the things in space. Space is a mystery. It's filled with adventures and I just want to touch the stars. Aloha from the great state of Hawaii. The National Space Society is proud to share with you the grand prize winning entry for its prestigious premier program, the NSS Space Settlement Contest. My name is Lynn Zielinski, and I am the NSS Vice President of Education and Outreach. For more than 25 years, thousands of students ages 12 to 18 
have submitted entries either as individuals or in teams from anywhere in the world. In 2021, more than 6,800 students submitted 1,600 entries or more to the contest from 22 countries. This year, the students constantly surprise us and amaze us with their passion, their ingenuity, creativity, and this year is no exception, as you will see. The grand prize winner uh, receives a $5,000 scholarship from the Herman Rubin Endowment Fund. Next slide. And the Starship Crystal, which is a 3D map of stars within the five parsecs of our sun. With thousands of exoplanets being discovered around these kinds of stars, we can look at them as being habitable, possible habitable places for humanity to settle in. And as a result, it would exemplify the whole idea behind the NSS vision, which is for people living and working in space to benefit the humanity on Earth. So with that, I am delighted to present to you the 2021 Grand Prize winning team from Makualani Christian Academy in Kona, Hawaii. The Aerospace Meridian team and their teacher advisor, Frederick Herman. Thank you, Lynn. We're very proud of our students and we have our beautiful uh, award here, a nice uh, three-dimensional, uh, somehow they got the stars' names in engraved in here. And it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, we're gonna put it on display at the school for everyone to enjoy. Yes, actually, um, this is a pair of bookends for you, I believe, because in 2019, your team also won the grand prize for another project that they did as well. And I believe three members of your team are still on this project. The others have graduated. Yeah, that was um, the Corpus project in 2019. And Hannah, Joe, and Austin were also part of that team. Yeah, and what's really cool and unique about your project is that you have done some experimentation with it. And unlike other projects presented in the Space Settlement Contest, the students uh, generally just do paper and pencil, but you guys actually did experiments. And what's really amazing is that I believe Austin and Andrew, you guys actually have a patent uh, that is um, given to you this year for what you developed in 2019 and augmented for this particular uh, contest. So congratulations, Austin and Andrew. Thank you. Yes, it's always more fun to conduct real life experiments than read something in a textbook. And, you know, blowing stuff up is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, with that, I will leave the team to give their presentation to you. Aloha and welcome to the 2021 NSS Space Settlement Contest Grand Prize presentation. Our team is Aerospace Meridian from Akualani Christian Academy in Kailua, Kona, Hawaii. And our project is titled The ASM Venus. I would like to start off by thanking everyone at the NSS for again awarding us with such a high honor. We are truly grateful. My name is Michaela Chang, and this is our team. From top left to right, we have Austin Pham, Jackson Flagel, Andrew Olasfrim, Josiah Richards, myself, Michaela Chang, Christian Tanya Memento, and Hana Husek. Our project has three phases. First, the construction of a ground station and transport ships. Second, transport to the asteroid 16 Psyche. And third, the construction of the ASM Venus. An imperative factor in spacefaring is being able to communicate between your space station and a home planet or base. To do this, a reliable ground station is needed. We took it upon ourselves to build a ground station because we were curious and wanted to prove we could receive signals from orbit. A simple ground station is composed of several components, an antenna, a transceiver, 
a rotator, a satellite tracking program, we use gpredict, and software that converts radio signals into computer code, we use SDR Sharp. This is the ground station that the Aerospace Meridian team has built to receive signals from passing satellites. Using a Yagi antenna, a rotator, and a tripod, we built what could be called nothing less than a masterpiece. This impressive piece of technology is capable of communicating with spacecraft, small and large, like CubeSats and the ISS. With the ground station complete, the crew members can focus on constructing the ASM Mercury. The Aerospace Meridian team developed a transport ship for the nearly 370 million kilometer journey from Earth to the asteroid 16 Psyche, the ASM Mercury. The ASM Mercury is a transport ship built in low Earth orbit. It will rotate in order to create artificial gravity, which will prevent the crew from the negative physical effects <laughs> caused by zero gravity. These maladies include bone deterioration and muscle loss, including weakening of the heart. It will also contain bigelospheres stacked in rows around its circumference. Why bigelospheres? Bigelospheres are lightweight. The surface of a bigelosphere is not a metal alloy, but an air mid fiber similar to Kevlar. They can be shipped to space in compact form, then inflated once in place. Thus, they are both more protective than a metal alloy and less expensive to transport. We are, in fact, planning two, not one, Mercury-class spacecraft, the ASM Mercury-1 and the ASM Mercury-2. Why do we need two Mercury transport ships? Crew members can live in one transport while the other is dismantled for the early construction of the ASM Venus. I will now pass things over to Andrew Olesfred, who will be discussing the shielding of the ASM Mercury. Hi, I'm Andrew Olesfred. Uh, there are several dangers for structures that are intended to exist in space long term. One such danger is high velocity particles, also known as HVPs. The dangers of HVPs do not lie in their size, as they are extremely small. However, they tend to move at speeds upwards of 30 kilometers a second. This gives them a similar kinetic energy to a bullet. Tens of millions of HVPs are estimated to be in Earth's orbit alone. An impact with an HVP is a guarantee. In 2019, several members of the current team won the NSS grand prize in the uh, space settlement contest with the ASM Corpus project. To develop shielding for a current project, we looked at the previous project for inspiration. The 2019 design used a diamond corrugated shielding uh, as the first layer of defense to deflect the HVPs and shrapnel in several directions. We identified this deflection shielding as one to be developed further. The diamond corrugated shielding was replaced with numerous hardened plastic spheroids that function on the same principle as deflection by dispersing the kinetic energy at various angles while bouncing off each other and the walls of the shielding. We added shear thickening fluid to dampen spheroid energy. A shear thickening fluid hardens when pressure is applied to it before returning to a more fluid state. By hardening against the motion of the spheroids, the shear thickening fluid reduces kinetic energy, adding significantly to the effectiveness of the shielding. A strong material was still needed to hold the components together. We decided on using Dyneema, a strong air mid fiber, 15 times stronger than iron, but still quite flexible. Dyneema is stronger than Kevlar and is hydrophobic, meaning that it will not absorb or leak the shear thickening fluid. Dyneema is therefore used as the external shell for the shield panel. These three components are combined into a shield panel. When an HVP impacts a shielding panel, it will disintegrate and its kinetic energy will transfer to the spheroids, which will collide with each other, resulting in a chain reaction that absorbs the kinetic energy. The shear thickening fluid will harden against the spheroids, dampening their mo motion. Our invention also allows for self-healing. When a puncture occurs, the spheroids will be drawn to the hole by the vacuum pressure of space, blocking the hole and reinforcing the damaged area. We decided on the sizes of these spheroids to vary with a precise amount, such that a spheroid one size smaller can fit through the gap of one size larger. This will ensure that the self-healing will always function at full efficiency. We tested our invention using a high-powered rifle. While we were not able to produce a full prototype, we were able to test the proof of concept by using configurations of aramid fibers, 
spheroids, and a shear thickening fluid. The tests demonstrated that the spheroids, aramid fiber, and the shear thickening fluid were able to effectively stop and deflect the bullet. With the full shielding, the test results showed only an entrance hole, but no exit holes. Testing variants such as the shear thickening fluid without the spheroids or spheroids without the shear thickening fluid resulted in significantly more damage. The conclusion to these experiments was that dyneema, spheroids, and shear thickening fluid was the optimal design. After the success of the testing, we decided to file a patent for the invention. The patent and application, we were fortunate enough to have a patent lawyer offer to the work pro bono, and our patent will be published this year. Our final shield panel design uses Dyneema, hardened plastic spheroids, and polyethylene glycol with suspended silica particles. Our design can easily be applied to Bigelow spheres. Thus, the ASM Mercury will be protected while in low Earth orbit and during transit to 16 Psyche. Now, though we have a shielded transport, we will need to move it to 16 Psyche. We will be using Hohmann transfers. Furthermore, we will also need to address the language transition for the multinational crew. Hanna Husek will be describing our plans. Hi, my name is Hanna Husek, and I will be discussing Hohmann transfer and language education. The Mercury will initiate its transfer orbit with a prograde burn. This will move it into an elliptical orbit around the sun with a periapsis at the Earth, and an apoapsis intersecting with the periapsis of 16 Psyche's orbit. Our teammate Jackson Flagel calculated that a prograde burn of 5.81 kilometers per second will be needed to achieve the desired transfer orbit. Unity is developed through communication, but how will ASM crew members communicate if they're from 10 different countries and use 10 different languages? In the isolation of space, crew members will need to overcome language barriers. It is helpful for crew members to be aware of what happens when people learn foreign languages. When a multilingual crew member switches between languages, personality changes occur. As you can see, there is a significant difference between me speaking Japanese and me speaking English. The same thing can happen to a crew member. The crew member's body language and facial expressions may change. This occurs when crew members adapt their personalities to the cultural norms of a particular language. Another phenomenon is foreign language anxiety. Depending on personality, gender, emotional intelligence, and learning preferences, crew members may feel anxious when languages are spoken. With these roadblocks in mind, we developed the ASM Foreign Language Program. We established that a uniform classroom environment will not be effective. Our plan is for crew members to be grouped together with people who have similar psychologies and learning styles. The program will require learning the English language or another major language. Conversational settings and learning preferences will minimize foreign language anxiety, allowing crew members to achieve foreign language fluency and creating crew unity. When the ASM Mercury class spacecraft approach the apoapsis of the transfer orbit, they will make an inclination change to match the orbital inclination of 16 Psyche. This will occur where the velocity of the spacecraft is the lowest, the lower velocity will minimize the amount of fuel needed for change. Retrograde apoapsis burns will place the Mercury transports into orbit around 16 Psyche. Our teammate Jackson Flagel calculated a retrograde burn of approximately 14 kilometers per second. Now that we arrived at 16 Psyche, it's time to construct the ASM Venus by recycling one Mercury transport and harvesting resources from the asteroid. Austin Pham will describe the ASM Venus. Hi, my name is Austin. Our first and foremost goal of the ASM Venus project is to ground each aspect of the space element in reality. This extends to power generation, external structure, and internal design. Power will be generated by nuclear energy rather than solar. We estimate that a total of 4.057 gigawatt hours of power is needed to provide a habitable environment, grow crops, and sustain the population. Because of the inverse square law, the sun is so dim that at least 64 million square meters of solar panels will be needed. With nuclear energy, a total of 34 kilograms of uranium fuel rods will be consumed every year, a far cry from the millions of tons of solar panels required. To reduce the weight and cost of the ASM Venus, we optimize the design of the space element for the most living area to the least surface area exposed to space. We found that a thin cylinder would be the most efficient design. 
with the ideal measurements being a 64 meter radius and a 2.5 kilometer height. Compared to a Stanford torus adjusted for population, the ASM Venus is five times more compact. We were curious about how a thin cylinder could be stabilized, so we conducted a test using TOPS. We found that extending mass from the center of the spin axis increased angular momentum. Weights placed on the ends of spokes extending from the midpoint of the space settlement store the angular momentum, making it harder for any disturbances to cause major shifts in the life-preserving spin. This spoke and weight system allows us to increase stability without spinning the space settlement faster, which would affect onboard gravity. Because of the long cylindrical shape of the space settlement, the interior of the Ace and Venus must have a reinforced structure. This is essential since the centrifugal forces will place a substantial amount of stress on the exterior walls. We wanted a repeating pattern to save space, and this limited us to hexagons, squares, and triangles. Of these three, the hexagon is by far the most stable and stress resistant. And hexagonal apartment blocks can be stacked. We often forget about the importance of mundane necessities like clean air. The dangers of heavy gases is, is alarming considering that due to centrifugal forces from generating artificial gravity, they will drift towards the floor of the space settlement and could suffocate small children. The AS and Venus will open vents in apartment floors when gas detectors detect the presence of heavy gases. Artificial gravity will force these heavy gases through the vents. The three phases that we have outlined, the preparatory low Earth orbit phase, the transportation phase, and the final construction phase, develop a vision for the future. A future where uh, that admittedly requires great bravery and persistence. A future where humankind has found a place among the stars. Mahalo nui loa, and a special thanks to our advisor, Frederick Herman, to our co-advisor, Christian Williams, to Lynn Zielinski for coaching us through this presentation, and to the National Space Society for giving us this opportunity. Thank you very much for listening. Congratulations to the Aerospace Meridian team. Thank you so much on behalf of the National Space Society and from Al Globus, who is the founder of the Space Settlement Contest, and his advisor help, um, Matthew Levine, who I know have ecstatically um, loved your, present, your project and your presentation. So thank you, everybody. You did a great job. Yeah, thank, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. National Space Society is proud of you. Have a great career in whatever you do. Hello, um, my name is Bryce Meyer and I'm a member of the NS National Space Society and I'm also a board of directors member uh, for Region 4 and I'm going to give you a presentation on uh, space farms and in particular how they help future space settlement. So you can see the slide title here, Space Agriculture for Cute Current Technology and Future Settlements. Um, this means that in settlements of the future, we will be using a lot of the technologies we've already perfected on Earth and just adapting them to space. 
So in the next slide, you'll see the current state. So if you go to the ISS, for example, the ISS has a big dehumidifier because most of the water that leaves your system comes out in your breath and your sweat, believe it or not. And so as a result, you need a dehumidifier to take that water, concentrate it back out and feed it back to you. Also on the ISS, you'll have a separating toilet. And what that does is that separates out the urine and especially the water from the urine, pipes it back after filtering it. And it takes the solids from the feces and squishes those out and sends that water back to you. And then of course, there's the air scrubber, which uses a series of, of zeolite filters and other things to take the oxygen out of the air, you, out of the carbon dioxide that you've expelled, send that oxygen back to you and take the carbon and toss it. So essentially the solids and the carbon in this whole current state just get burned up. And so it's expensive resupply. As a result in the near future, you go one step beyond that. And the one step beyond that would still have that dehumidifier because we can't get rid of the fact we breathe out a lot of uh, water. But you can add instead the, the toilet flushing into a septic tank or a digester. And what that is, is it's a giant tank that holds a bunch of bacteria and enzymes that break down your waste. And as a result, now we're taking the CO2 and the, and the nutrient rich water and using that. And we can use that for plants and algae in order to provide food and clean water back to us and also to create oxygen that we might want. So you see that this is a better closed cycle. And so just one step beyond the current state with just a couple plants and algae in the mix, we are now starting to close the cycle. So let's go to the next slide, please. So essentially what a space farm is, is, is where that plant, those plants were in those other systems. And so a space farm can close the mass cycle and it's more than just plants. So as you already saw, you had the digester, which is essentially a thing called a bioreactor or a tank that holds a biology, holds bacteria or yeasts or thereabouts. And it uses it in machinery to accomplish a goal. In this case, break down the waste and the carbon dioxide water. You will also have SCADA systems. So SCADA systems are supervisory control and data acquisition or otherwise known as control systems. And factories on earth already have these. You'll have to have heat management, dehumidifiers, filters and sterilizers, and lots of pipes, pumps, fans, and tanks. So a space farm is more than just the living things in it. It's the living things plus a lot of other machinery. And as a result, the space farm can close the whole mass cycle with carbon dioxide, dirty water, and wastes, and come out with food, oxygen, and water. And on the next slide, you'll see that this is something that we can implement with current technology. So all those things I just mentioned exist now. So for example, if you have any pharmaceuticals or if you've had any type of additive that's added to your food or even a lot of food straight up or created in chemical factories. And in chemical factories, you have these giant vats with a bunch of complex control systems that result in a series of reactions to create whatever they want out of the other side. So that's technology one. You also have vertical farms, and these are essentially building-sized hydroponic farms that grow a lot of vegetables and grow fish, grow plants, grow whatever you want for various food items. Hydroponic gardens, we already know all about those, and in fact, they're used in a wide variety of industries now. And in fact, in Europe, a lot of the vegetables that are produced in the winter come from hydroponic gardens that are in vertical farms. There's also waste management systems. That's what happens when you flush the toilet now and high density outdoor soil farms even. So current soil farms are so dense, the rows are so dense that you can't even walk between them, but they produce 50% more than they did in the 1950s. So these are all current technologies that we can now borrow and take to space to close that mass loop. So on the next slide, you'll see one way to do that. So let's say you only have a teeny little spaceship and you have something maybe bigger than the ISS. Maybe you're headed to Mars, for example, or you have a moon base or a small Mars base. And you can close the loop with just these vats or bioreactors using algae, using yeast, and using a septic system, which essentially is where the flush goes, right? So the flush goes into the septic system, the septic system breaks it down into carbon dioxide, water, nutrient water, pipes that, around the system into the hydroponic garden, which you can have a small little garden, but most of it's gonna end up in the algae. Algae will turn that back into more algae and release oxygen. 
and some then you can squish the algae to get the water out and then you have yeast which maybe you can add a little protein as a result so this system will keep you alive and it will close the mass loop totally but the problem is it is not the most appetizing menu out there you're essentially going to have 3d printed glop and some salad and some water to drink too which to me if i'm living on that for a year or two for a mission that sounds pretty bad so on the next slide we'll see something else so let's talk about what you would do to get to something else so in addition to those plants and algae which we already talked about and the yeasts and bacteria of bats, which again, we talked about, you probably ought to add either some animals or maybe some complicated fungi like mushrooms, and you vastly expand your plant growing. And so the bigger the settlement gets, the more options you have in these three big areas. And if you see, there's this loop that happens inside the farm itself. So if you notice, if you have funguses and yeasts and bacteria, they're creating nutrients, water, and carbon dioxide to go right back into the farm for the plants and algae. And the plants and algae, while they do, are the big producer of oxygen that you need and a minor producer of food, they're also the receiver for a lot of other things in the farm. And that, that as a result, these plants or algae, the trimmings that come from the things that you don't eat, for example, like the tomato trimmings that are trimmed leaves or the roots or whatever, they can be digested through these animals and fungi and then they can generate waste that are used in other processes. So the farm creates its own cycle for mass flow on top of the mass flow that comes from you. And as a result, the more stuff you have in these farm in these three categories, and really in the plants or algae and the animals or fungus, the more diverse your menu gets and the more fun it is to eat. So instead of just salad and glop, you can have salad and some funguses, some other vegetables, and maybe something like a shrimp or tilapia, and as a result, I also might have an extra vat that does some fermentation, and I might have a little beer or sake with it, which is a much happier existence. So being on the next slide, the gist is this. The more options you have, you have more options with bigger and older settlements. So initially, you'll start with those algae vats, right? Because that's how you get out of the gate. Algae reproduce real quick. And as a result, I can recycle my carbon dioxide fast, and I can get something to eat. While not appetizing, it'll keep me alive. And then I start my hydroponic garden. In my hydroponic garden, I'll grow some greens and I'll grow tomatoes probably, or crops like that, that are very readily adapted to hydroponic conditions. And then maybe I start a small mushroom farm. But as I advance further along in my hydroponics, I start building a much larger facility, and maybe I start adding some substrates to my hydroponics. And as a result, I can start growing tubers like potatoes, as you see here, right? Or legume crops like soybeans. And those add even more menu and diversity. I, I got more starches, and now I've got some oils that I can start expanding with. Now, going past that, I get a little bit more soil development or substrate development. Maybe I just start with soil even. And I can start growing grains. And as a result, I can produce a lot of calories out of these grain crops. Finally, once I really have a well-developed soil system, I can start with bushes. And one of the key kind of bushes, of course, for many of us is coffee. And then, of course, you can end up with trees. Now, the thing about this is the more diverse my crop structure is, I can also start producing crops for export. And so if I have a well-developed soil grow, for example, now I can start talking about maybe moon coffee or Martian coffee is something I ship back to Earth. And then when tourists come and visit me, I can provide the local produce for their meals, which is a lot better than they would normally expect if they're taking an initial trip to the ISS right now. So settlement size and time result in a more diverse plant structure. On the next slide, you can see how this would develop to animals as well. And so if you notice with animals, the first animal on here is something that most of us Westerners don't eat a lot of, and it's bugs. So bugs like mealworms or our crickets are actually a very easy to grow small micro livestock that you can start with right away. And as a result, you can use them as part of your recycling strategy as well and pre-digest things that maybe you send to your septic tank system or to your yeasts and bacteria system. So you can start with bugs, but maybe you wanna go right up away to a small tank that grows some shrimp or a slightly bigger tank at some point that starts growing 
algae feeders like tilapia. Now, that doesn't mean you're growing tuna or, or rainbow trout right away, for example, because they're not really herbivores. And these all these animals on my far left here can all eat vegetable wastes and algae. So these can all be fed for by a very early system, and they just really need the space in the water flow. If you want to go step past that and let's start talking about eggs for breakfast, then I start talking about chickens. So maybe I take chickens and I put in a small chicken coop. And as I'm starting to develop my soil farm, I start letting the chickens feed in the soil farm to pick up any, any leftovers on the ground. And maybe I start talking about living soil where I have insects and other things growing inside of it. One step beyond the chickens and also very space friendly is rabbits or other rodents. Now, again, the, the leap from chicken to rabbit is a big one. And the reason it's a big one is because there's not as much edible protein on a rabbit per, per capita as there is per chicken or even per fish or poor shrimp or poor bug. So you start ending up with a larger waste once you make that leap over to mammals. And definitely if you try to leap all the way to goats or to cows, which have been proposed in the past, and it would take a truly well-developed and long range settlement to have both goats and cows, because now you have to have a substantial soil area or feedlot area and a substantial way to feed them. And the thing to know about animals is they add, they add a lot of menu diversity. They're really good at chewing things up. But at some point, the, the, the leap to mammals requires a little more energy and it requires a lot of, a lot of the ability to move mass around to the farm. Because I already told you about the fact that the farm starts creating its own mass flow once it gets large enough. This isn't necessarily a problem if you have something that you've already built in a lot of infrastructure, but if you haven't gotten there yet, It'll be a very long time before you even see eggs or rabbits. So overall, I've talked about the fact that space farms are something that we can do now, right? They're something that we already have the capability to do using existing technologies that are, we're just gonna move to space. And those existing technology include factory things, chem, things from chemical factories, things from septic systems or waste systems, plumbing systems, heat management systems, air movement with fans, pumps, blowers, vent pipes, pipes, and definitely control systems or SCADA systems that are already in existence. Combining these all together is a lot more than a hydroponic garden or a vat of algae or yeast. But the result is, as you start building this level and this deep level of control, it's way past just cycling nutrients. Now it's a fully diverse menu that makes life living in space worth living and long-term settlement possible. Thank you. Hi, my name is Larry Bartosik and I am a space ambassador. My day job is designing experiments for nuclear and high energy physics research. I started writing talks for fifth graders when my friend Donna asked me to explain things to her class that she didn't know about. Things like black holes and supernovae, space elevators and the periodic table. I love talking to kids because their minds are so open to new and unusual possibilities like climbing a ribbon from the ground to space. I began writing talks to all ages, educations, and interests of audiences. I've given a talk on settling the solar system to the Lifelong Learning Institute, where the youngest person in the audience is 50 years old. I wrote a talk about my experiences building the Sloan Digital Sky Survey Telescope at Apache Point Observatory, and what a huge impact the Sloan Survey has had on astronomy. For several years, I wrote talks for the Mensa Regional Gathering in Wisconsin, including my talk, A History of the Universe, starting with the Big Bang. Writing talks like that forces me to do a lot of research on the topic to get the facts right. Lately, I've been giving a talk called The Connection Between the Periodic Table and Astronomy. I describe how starlight can tell us so much about the overall structure of the universe and how that light comes from the electrons around atoms in the stars. I also talk about where the elements come from and how the elements drive a star's life. My hobby since 2004 has been the space elevator. I've given talks to many groups, including University Colloquia, Fermilab, Rotary Clubs, about the elevator and how it will transform moving into space. I tailor my talks for each unique audience. 
If the group is my local chapter of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, I'll focus on the machine design aspects of the elevator or the Sloan telescope that my colleagues can relate to. If it's to a group of kids about space settlements, I'll focus on what life will be like and the things people will be able to do in space settlements that they can't do on Earth, like fly a pedal-powered aircraft in the middle of an O'Neill cylinder. One of my favorite questions from a fifth grader was whether chickens on a space habitat would grow gigantic. Thank you. Welcome to the exciting world of space elevators. I'm Jerry Eddy. I'll be interviewing Peter Swan. We at the International Space Elevator Consortium believe that the modern space elevator is ready to start development. Peter, why space elevators? Okay, well, thanks for this opportunity uh, for the National Space Society. I really feel like this is America's conference. I've come to many of them, and I really enjoy it. And thanks, Dr. Eddie, for agreeing to be the interviewee and asking me questions. That'll help. Our presentation today will show where the modern-day space elevator is. There are essentially four things we'd like to you to think about as we go through this little presentation. The first one is that the space elevators, when they're mature, will be moving massive amounts of cargo to geosynchronous and beyond. And the key point there is we'll be moving 70% of the delivery uh, of the mass at the uh, top of the ocean. We'll be having a percentage of delivery to geo at 70%. And when the system is mature, We'll be talking about 170,000 metric tons per year to geo and beyond. Our early operations will only be 30,000 tons per year. The second point is that the permanent space elevator in infrastructure will be environmentally productive, uh, positive. First, it will raise the mass using electricity. So it's the green road to space with the massive capability will be able to enable green missions at geosynchronous such as space solar power. The third thing is the material is ready. We have a piece of material greater than one meter long. It's been shown to be strong enough. So we have a material already that is long uh, that can be long enough and is strong enough to be our space elevator tether. The people at the University of Manchester have advertised that we should have a material in time for our uh, schedule for space elevators, like in 2038 as a, a time period. And the last point is space elevators approach movement of mass in a very simple and elegant solution uh, with respect to the rocket equation. They ignore it. They avoid the rocket equation. So we literally can provide massive movement to geo and beyond. The next chart shows where we are in today's world with respects to dreams. We're looking at the National Space Society, who really, truly has believed for the last 40 years that we should have people living and thriving off planet. This next chart will then also show that Dr. Uh, or that Mr. Musk wants his million people on Mars. In addition, Jeff Bezos wants to build the road to space. So we have truly many, many dreams and many visions to move off planet. The kicker is that each of these require massive amounts of tonnage. Mr. Musk has asked for a million tons to Mars. Dr. Mankins has asked for five million tons to uh, geosynchronous for the space solar power system. And the L5 Society slash National Space Society slash Mr. Bezos vision is 10.5 million tons to the L5 location. The next chart kind of shows our vision. We're trying to match the vision of these big thinkers, and we show how we would set up a series of galactic harbors around the equator. Now, each galactic harbor would have two space elevators. 
one principal, one backup, one up, one down, whatever they decide to use their two space elevators for, or just two straight up and don't care about coming back. So we have multiple options, but we see two space elevators per galactic harbors, and we see three galactic harbors forming in the near future as they would be competitive. Uh, commercial versus government, government versus government, commercial versus commercial, there will be a lot of competition to be able to move that much mass for the dreams and customer demands of the future. Now, I've mentioned 170,000 tons before. Let's compare it to what we've done in the history of mankind. The history of mankind has only put up 22,000 tons total to orbit. Our initial year of operations of two single space elevators would do 30,000 tons per, uh, per year. So we would do more in one year than we've done in the history of mankind. So our vision is the space elevator is going to be moving massive tonnage to geo and beyond in a green road to space. Okay, the, the next, go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, I was just going to say, why are you so optimistic about space elevators now? That's, that's the essence of the presentation. We're excited about space elevators because we are ready to enter the second phase of four in a developmental program. Now, the second phase is engineering validation, and you can read that test, 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 and then there's more testing. So we're at the phase where we start building components and segments, and then we start testing them. And of course, the material will be right in there. There's got to be a major program developing the material and testing it. So we're right there. But how can we be sure we jump from the technology feasibility box to the next one? And the answer is we've done 15 studies over the last few years that have shown different things. The ISIC study reports have addressed all the different segments in the total space elevator system. And so we've looked at the apex anchor, we've looked at the earth port, we've looked at the tether, tether climbers, et cetera, et cetera, the op center. We've also looked at space debris. We've looked at space debris in two year long studies, and we've shown that space debris is manageable for a space elevator architecture. One of the points there is we would have multiple legs coming down from 2000 kilometers to add the, the statistics to us. So we've done studies inside ISIC and those are available on our website. There've been two of those International Academy of Astronautics reports. Now, this is an organization that's a thousand space experts from around the globe, all the different countries that are space players. And they say that space elevators are feasible. And that was the first study in 2014. And then the second one was called the road to space because we looked at all the TRLs and show that the TRLs are there for us. Now, the one lagging TRL was the material but that's moving so fast that we're in pretty good shape. Now, the kicker is a major corporation, not sponsored by too many governments or anything else, the Obayashi Corporation did a complete design study for a space elevator to move people to geo and beyond. That's an awesome little uh, thing. I think that's really neat. So, Peter, why, why do we need space elevators when rockets have always done such a great job? Okay, next chart, please. Okay, the answer is we need rockets. We love rockets. They have done a spectacular job. Up, and we hope that the new advanced rockets of, you know, Blue Origin and SpaceX and the NASA Space Launch System, and then the, the Europeans and the Russians, everybody's getting into new rockets, so are the Chinese. So we need rockets to provide the rapid transit through radiation belts for people. We need them to do LEO. We need to do a lot of things with rockets. And we're not going to be there till 2038 or so. So we need rockets to open up the moon and start the colonies. We need them to go to Mars and start the colonies there. So we need and love rockets. 
The point is that once we become real, then we are able to move the heavy stuff. So they move people in valuable uh, critical items and we move the massive amounts to the locations. So it really is a dual space access architecture that will really enable the activities. So that's really where we're at. We support rockets, they're great. Well, what is this green road to space that Isaac is talking about? Okay, the next chart shows the cover of our report. Now, Dr. Eddie was actually the editor for this and spent like 18 months on this topic. So I'm kind of stealing his thunder, but it's okay. <laughs> anyway, the kicker is that we looked at space elevators and there are three really, really important factors that came out. The first is that we're raising stuff with electricity. So that electrical raise is really environmentally friendly. So we call it the green road to space. I like that. We think of it as the second lane in the road that uh, that uh, Mr. Bezos wants to do. He wants to do a road to space, so we'll be a second lane. That would be no problem. The second aspect of the green road to space is that it is a movement of massive uh, cargo to geosynchronous, and we can enable programs like space uh, solar power. We showed in Chapter 3, uh, Dr. David Dotson wrote that chapter, we showed how we could enable space solar power in a very timely manner and actually reach the goals of providing enough energy to stop. Now, Dr. Mankin says if he can get the right amount of power at the right time, he can stop global warming by eliminating like a thousand coal plants. So we feel that the space elevator can enable this, whereas rockets might not make that. So we are very supportive of the idea of environmental impact and how the uh, space elevators would really make it a lot uh, more robust, a lot more uh, capability uh, to help our environment. Okay, Peter, might I add a little bit about chapter four? Sure. Uh, chapter four deals with the nuclear waste problem. And it's one that uh, has been very difficult for people to solve. In fact, most countries haven't been able to agree uh, on a method. What we were proposing is that we take the waste up the elevator and put it into orbits inside our own toward the sun for permanent storage of, and totally away from man completely. And the point is that if we could do this, I think uh, nuclear power would all of a sudden become more popular. People, countries would uh, know that they'd have a solution for their nuclear waste problem, and thus many more nuclear plants could be developed or built and also help them solve the environmental problem. Yeah, I, I thought that was a very interesting chapter, especially since I had to do the orbits. And it was fun trying to figure out how to get into a low solar orbit so that it would never come close to the Earth again. But it's doable in, in, with today's technology, so no problem. Okay, Peter, uh, what's your vision for the future? It seems like we really are opening up a big door here. Okay, well, it turns out that we've got multiple things going on, so I thought I'd just explain one or two things. The first is, the Apollo program was fantastic, and as I said earlier, we love rockets. But the problem with rockets is their delivery statistic. They only deliver a half a percent of the mass that was on the liftoff pad to the surface of the moon. And they really can't get much better than that with the chemistry we're using today or even in the near future rockets. So their delivery statistics are poor. So the conundrum of rockets is, why do we continue to use a delivery statistic that's uh, like a half a percent? The answer is, it's the only method around. And we love rockets and we need to have them do that, but space elevators would provide massive movement to these locations. So the next chart is one that uh, I've enjoyed over time because I worked with Arizona State University and they had a very good program where they assessed the release 
of cargo from the tip of the space elevator as it rotated around at 7.6 kilometers per second. And that's just a natural rotation uh, velocity when you release. With that, Arizona State University did the orbital equations and all this kind of stuff and came up with three conclusions. One is we definitely could move massive tonnage. That's uh, a foregone conclusion. But they could release every day. They did not have to wait for a 26-month alignment of the planets. And the reason is that you could take a long time. If you're sending hammer and nails, you don't really care about the fast transit. But a scheduler can launch every day of the year, doesn't have to wait 26 months. The other remarkable conclusion they came to is with that velocity, you can cut the corner and you can get to Mars in 61 days. Now, the average was around 120 days, but uh, and they had a few of them at a 400 days, stuff like that. But basically, you're not restricted to 26 months and seven or eight month travel. So you can really do something well there. So the new vision is leverage the strength of the space elevator. Now, the next chart is one that addresses the activities of uh, space debris. We know that the space debris is there. We just finished a second study. They're both listed there. Second study addressing the survivability approach for space debris. What we did is we leveraged NASA's space debris density numbers projected to 2030, showing the increase in debris from the constellation of satellites, the new constellations, all of them. And the answer is the same as a study in 2010 and 2019 in that space debris mitigation is an engineering and management problem with definable quantities such as density of debris, length and width of targets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we believe we're a manageable problem. And the figure on the right shows one of the approaches on the design architecture. We'd have multiple tethers coming down from 2,000 kilometers. Okay, the next chart, it kind of reflects what has occurred in the last 15 years or so. And the answer is that we've done a lot of studies, intense studies in different topics. Most of these on the top, the ISIC studies, are all on our website and available in PDF free download. The IAA studies can be purchased from their website. And uh, we, can, we have covered just about all the aspects of the space elevator. And you can look in there and answer most of your questions from those studies. Okay, the next uh, page is our basic message. And we've been working this since Dr. Edwards in 2001. Actually, there was a NASA conference in 98, and they addressed space elevators. And Dr. Edwards took it to the next level. And then ISIC has taken it further in the Obiachi Corporation in the International Academy of Astronautics. But the basic message is space elevators take massive freight to geo and beyond on a green road to space. And we love that because we would then be providing an avenue to take mass up and create missions that will help the Earth. So the bottom line is space elevators will be there in about 2037, 2038. And we're really hoping that we can recognize the value of space elevators in that their delivery statistics of 70% to geo and beyond is remarkable and deserves that space elevators should be initiated today. Oh, thank you, Peter. That's really great. And we are on the forefront of something very big and exciting. And if you'd like to uh, learn more about us, you can go to the website, www.iscc.org, and see some of those reports. If They uh, do cover a lot of the main topics that we're concerned with. And we'd actually like for you to join us. We'd also like to thank the NSS for giving us this time today and hope that uh, our future is a bright one in space. Thank you.